Ah. Mama. Mama. We made it. <laughs> what it, what it, what it do though? Good God. Wow. This feels fucking phenomenal. That felt really good. For those of you that don't know, or maybe do, we've taken a break for a second. I needed to let that out. We're back in business. I needed to like let that out. I'm glad I got to see that, fellas. You feel me? Whoa. Yeah. It's a gorgeous experience. The harmonies were really quite on point, I let me say. You. Yeah. We were practicing. <laughs> Your two favorite uncles are back in fucking business. <laughs> you dig? Uncle Nushi in the building. Uncle Roushi in the building. And we got an extremely special guest, my brother Joe Weil. The Don Dada of Psycho Films. What it do, baby? What up? What up, fellas? My brother, it's an absolute honor to have you on. Oh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here, guys. Thank you. It's man. it's actually Thank incredible. You. I want to start with a little like preface to the scenario of you know, while and I met uh, when he was a student at, at USC, and I was working with Azad and them, um, and we had come across this this group of fucking incredibly talented videographers directors just like film savants in the making and coming from a school like sc you know what the fuck going on we, we build them killers you know what i'm saying mm. and we actually have three trojans sitting at the fucking table right now wow that's good you feel me we fighting on keep Don't us off that donation there. list please <laughs> <laughs> you feel me i hang up on them all the time but on some real shit like this has actually been a gorgeously long time coming um and one of the biggest reasons uh, just aside, outside of just the fact that, you know, you're a creative genius, I truly admire and respect your work and your human being, um, is that, you know, along the way, we all go through our little ebbs and flows. And just like to be able to see somebody like yourself really open up to your own community, it just showed me such growth and gave me so much inspiration in seeing how much you were able to like give out to the community and just open yourself up and be so vulnerable. It, like mm. touched my fucking soul to read, you know, the different posts that you made and just different realizations that you've had within your life at, at these like these past few years. And it was a fucking gorgeous thing to see. Mm. Um, you know, and I think one thing that a lot of us tend to forget along this arduous path we call life is how freeing that sense of vulnerability becomes mm. like we, we, we hold all this shit in. We, we feel like everything needs to be okay. When somebody asks us how we're doing, everything's good. We're all, we're keeping it together. We want to put our best face forward. Um, but the, the reality is a lot of us are going through things in our own lives, whether it's personal, professional, whatever it is. And the freedom of being able to express it, far outweighs the the pain and the chains of holding it into that like altogether so mentality true. of course so true. um and it actually you know during times in my life like popping across one of your posts just brightened my day you know what i'm saying because it's like we don't understand the value of things like that until we're able to see it mm -hmm. um and i commend you bro it's, it's absolutely thank you fucking thank beautiful. you you know what i mean yeah i mean i think uh you know, like as you were saying earlier, there are days that you feel like a genius or you feel like creatively in sync and there are days where you're like questioning why you're even doing the thing and that's so fundamental to what the journey is, sure, you know? Sure, sure. And uh, I think it applies obviously like super heavily to people that are pursuing creative things, but even if you're doing whatever, you know, data analyst, I don't yeah. know, biotech guy like the questioning is just part of the journey you know and absolutely I think absolutely yeah. being creatives we're just kind of pressed like to be honest about it for sure you know because there's almost like really no like sense of structure in those types of fields you know what i'm saying like if you're a data analyst or in the real estate profession you have a baseline yeah you know what i'm saying but in creative and i feel like it's all relative but when it comes to the creative endeavors you really don't have that baseline it's literally eat what you kill mm -hmm. so you're constantly um fighting for to be able to float financially and mentally the whole fucking way well yeah it's hard to have an anchor absolutely you know especially being creative something that requires like your imagination new ideas innovation and just a constant blank canvas can, that can be intimidating when you're like i gotta put something on this every single day yeah. and there's there's nothing like 
you know, at least when you have something that's more, uh, you know, routine or I guess, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Just something that, that requires the same thing every day. Yeah. You can expect it. You're like, all right, this is what I do. You lock down. It gives you a, an anchor to hold on to. Creative is just like, oh, shit. What are we doing today? Yeah. Yeah. R- routine is, a, is definitely a big part of it. You know, if you... If you're a creative, you can't go on autopilot ever, especially not at the earlier part you sure. know, of your career, just because it's not, you can't fall into that rotation. You can't fall into that routine of just kind of, you know, doing what the job calls for and knowing that you're, you know, as you were saying, you eat what you kill, like you got to go after it. And every day, every week, like I can barely plan. Sometimes it feels like, because you know, who the fuck knows what yeah. I'm going to be doing three weeks from now. For sure. You know, that's just kind of the nature of, <laughs> of the beast. Even, you know, I mean, I don't know about the highest levels, but even, you know, from the people that I've seen around me and that have inspired me and like my mentors seeing, you know, at every stage in the game, it doesn't matter. Like time is the most precious, you yeah, know, every time. the most valuable resource and we all have the same amount of it. And so, sure. you know, just like, figuring out how you're going to move in that is, is I feel like, you know, something that's, that's especially pressing when you don't have that sort of like routine. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes I think that like what artists need to find, like what's something that's been helpful (laughs) to me is to figure out how I can put routine into my life, you know, and how you can sort of say, you know, not every day is the same, but this is one of these type of days. This is like a day where I'm going to be writing and creating, and this is the headspace and the routine that I need for this. And oh, this is a production day, and I'm shooting something, and like this is the routine that's going to set me up for that thing. You know, it's kind of forcing these like small routines, small gestures, small process mm-hmm. into the chaos because, Absolutely. yeah, otherwise, like who the fuck knows? And, and you just walk around. And I around think one and, thing that, on. like, especially yeah. creatives or those on that path, uh, like, we, we tend to forget or we tend to kind of brush over is I truly believe if anybody is pursuing a creative path that step one is you have to be brutally fucking honest with yourself. Which is hard. Like sure. to the fucking core. You know what I'm saying? Because like it sounds sexy to be a musician or fucking a, a director or a right. fucking writer. Like, And I feel like especially in areas where like LA where people come to do these creative paths, like it, people get caught up. I feel like sometimes more so than not in the, the sound of how good it feels. And then also when we're like graduating colleges and fighting our parents because they don't know what the fuck we're doing. Sure. And we're telling them this, that and the other, but like we're riding that wave of like, no, you don't fucking get it. No, you don't get it. But there has to be a moment. And I think that people like gradually, it's either you, you get eaten or you like grow past it of if you really are going to get down into the nitty gritty of an endeavor, especially a creative one, and it's all relative to all different careers also, right? But like you have to be so honest to the point where you're truly willing to die for it. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah, being able to endure suffering is something that is honestly a huge part of what I think sets people apart who like stay in the game. You know, that's for like, sure so fundamental i mean people want to talk about like all the other things that are very important talent and luck and getting your big break but part of it is literally just being down to like suffer well past where other people are like nah i'm gonna get a real job nah i'm about to go do this thing like i'm gonna give up on this aspect uh and you know like love and respect to those people for sure because everybody has their own you know threshold for like what they're willing to take but i think that that is a huge part of, you know, huge. trying to to make it in the creative space is, yeah, wanting it for yourself and being able to defer this idea of something, you know, what you ultimately want to do or what you ultimately want to be with, you know. Absolutely. Having to take shit right now and just, for you sure. know. It's also a, a space where it's really hard to measure your wins because it's like a, in a more conventional kind of job, you can, you're provided tasks, deadlines, you do the task, you hit the deadlines, you got it on to the next, you could get your promotion. There's like very tangible things Thanks. that happen routinely through throughout a year you, that you can expect and project for and hit those targets every time. Whereas the creative space, it's so like when it's a win, you're like, damn, we're on. But those are so, they can be <coughs> completely spontaneous. And, and it's very hard to like between. measure those tangible wins unless it's like, really big because the other time is like mostly just struggling 
Right. So, and that being said, for sure, I want to take it back to to the to the early days when when Young Joe came swinging out the womb. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Where are you from originally? Uh, St. Louis. Yeah, I grew up in basically nice. a suburb about. 15 minutes from downtown St. Louis. Oh, cool. Wow. Lived in the house that I was born in nice. until I moved west at 18. So, really? you know, yeah, very what, much. What, what, what was childhood like for you? Childhood was, uh, it was great. Yeah, you know, I uh, was able to explore my creative impulses. Uh, you know, I was raised in a pretty, you know, traditionally middle class home. Uh, we always had everything that we needed while certainly learning a lot of lessons about not having excess and, you know, the value of money and the value of a dollar and all of these things. I grew up relatively Jewish, you know, fairly observantly Jewish. And there was a nice community uh, in St. Louis that, you know, growing up, I was really a part of in that sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, you know, St. Louis is, uh, it's a great town. It's a great town. There's a lot of rich history there there's a lot of music a lot of jazz and blues there's a lot of art uh one of the dopest things about st louis actually is that all of the museums are free mm. oh really? it's not like here if you want to go to the you know lacma there's you know 20 bucks whatever the art museums are free the science center is free oh, the wow. zoo is free oh, so shit. you know there's a lot of access for all different types of people to be in these places and uh yeah, so no, it, it was a great place to live and a great place to grow up. And obviously, once you move somewhere else, there are things that you sort of naturally miss about home. There are things that you sort of start to become more critical of. I'm not going to, you sure. know, act like St. Louis doesn't have major faults because it does. But no, my uh, experience growing up, honestly, when I came out here, I kind of had somewhat of a culture shock just realizing, you know, how different the rest of the world is. Not so much in LA, but especially seeing people who I like went to college with who came from all over the place. Yeah. It really made me realize how blessed I was to grow up in a place where I was exposed to diversity, where I was exposed to liberal ideas, where I was exposed to people with, you know, various economic, you know, statuses, just like different religions. It was just, you know, I, I feel like, uh, yeah, I feel like I was just kind of exposed to the world in a way that I, I started to value much more once I realized that that wasn't the case for a lot of people. Awesome. Yeah. How were um, some ways you were you were able to explore your creative side? Where did you first realize you were even a creative person or interested in that in that kind of realm of things as a kid? Uh, you know, so uh, as the, the story that my family always tells is that I pretty much always was obsessed with movies mm -hmm. and... Uh, when I was a kid, I mean, even beyond some of my memory or I have, you know, sort of flash, not fully formed memories of seeing a movie and stay restaging the movie, you know, with all of my cousins right after, like, oh, you know, shit. we would see Jumanji and I would be the one who we would go back to the house and I'd say, oh, you do this and you do this and oh, you be the wow. monkey and you be the crazy guy, you know, and like just literally even like my memory was so, I think... The thing that, like, my grandma always says is, like, you recited the movies, like, verbatim. Like, wow. already that was, like, programmed into me to be like, oh, this is something that I remember and pay attention to. You know what I'm saying? Like, the lines, the dialogue, just, like, I love the world, you know, uh, and those, like, adventures. And uh, so that's definitely, I mean, pretty much my whole life kind of was something that I was very interested in. Mm. And just always, as a kid, was trying to do projects and always trying to enlist my parents my mom had a camcorder you know to help me shoot this friend doing this you know like all of those things that's incredible did your parents help kind of um f help you fulfill that were they supportive of that you know there, there were a lot of things that were present in my house that allowed me i think to access uh art it early from an early age you know mm. they're just things that showed me the value of art uh one of them is that my grandfather uh who's since passed away for my parents wedding he gave them season tickets or for one of their anniversaries he gave them season tickets to the local fox theater which where they would stage you know all the big broadway productions so they would come mm. to town like you know, Wicked or Avenue Q or Les Mis or whatever. And so that's, for example, something that like my whole life growing up, I was always once a month, once every two months on Sunday night, get dressed up and go to the theater and see that's the show awesome. and like Incredible. see the value of that and experience that, you know. Um, 
like I said, all these museums were free. Going to art fairs and art festivals and sort of all those different things was always kind of around. You know, I, I mean, my parents are by no means artsy, hippie kind of people. My father actually, before I was born, was a, a still photographer oh. as a hobby. Um, but not really when I was growing up. That sort of had become an, an older hobby of his. But, you know, there's definitely... Uh, a visual side to my dad that, you know, I think, uh, I inherited some of and, uh, nice. yeah, no, it was a very, you know, nurturing environment to sort of look into and explore. Like, I mean, this is as a kid, this is before you even know what you're doing and thinking, sure. it's just like, sure. how are your interests, you know? Uh, but I mean, I feel like that's what action figures are, you know, like that's the whole thing. You get the toys and you make up the story and you Absolutely. like play with them and, you know, it's just like, for me, that was the fun of it was, you know, just thinking of the story. For sure. Yeah, no, it's, it's important to be in an environment like that where you can be creative versus like a very restricted household, um, especially because you mentioned you were observant Jew, which I mean, it's just observant anything more conservative, anything sure. can, pro can provide a conservative <laughs> environment. Um, not necessarily, and it could be just geared more towards like academia or um in your case, maybe Jewish studies or things like that, where, you know, as you're a kid and these ideas kind of start flowing to be creative, I'm always really interested in kind of the household environment, especially supported by the parents, because I think that really influences you to kind of who you are as an adult. What no, was that, definitely. What was that dynamic like, like the parents and, and the kids in your family? Uh, You know... It was very, I have, a, I have a younger sister. So oh. first let me set that up. Yeah, I have a younger sister. She's three years younger than me. It's just the two of us and, you know, my parents. Um, I mean, my life growing up, uh, yeah, I, I can't say that I didn't encounter and clash heads with the parents like, you know, everybody kind of does, we you know. Do. Uh, but especially in my, you, you know, super youth, I was like very close with my parents, Beautiful. you know. Uh and close to the community and, and all of that, so. Awesome. Were you able to, like, be pretty, um, when you say close with your parents, just did, what, did you feel you were able to be openly communicative about kind of things you were going through and what you were you were uh, pursuing, what you were interested in, and that kind of close, or just, like, good family relationship? Um, you know, I think that we, many of us naturally like go through a change around, you know, like the time of puberty and just like starting to be your own person. And no, I definitely wouldn't, I wouldn't define myself like, especially as I became more of an adolescent as the person that was like close with my parents, mm. you know, mm -hmm. um, I think that we are close by like virtue of being a family and like, there's a lot of, you know, ways that they like really supported me. Uh, nice. but no, I, I went through the typical sort of like, you know, rejection of parental figures during that sort of like time in my life. And, uh, you know, they definitely supported me through it in many ways. I think that, you know, in my, in my house, like, especially once I, really started to pursue the film thing. And now I'm talking about like, you know, when I'm in middle school or like high school, mm -hmm. it was always, it was always a balance. It was like academics were very, very important. Mm -hmm. uh, my father, he has a PhD in math, just oh, straight wow. mathematics. Fuck. Gorgeous. And like, yeah. yeah. And uh, <laughs> yeah, shit is crazy. <laughs> it's just straight, straight math. math. And, and math, I, I and math is a subject that I'm fucking terrible at. Yeah. And I don't have the mind for it. And, uh, you know, it's That's not just that I didn't have the mind for it. I think that a lot of things about school came very, very easy to me. I mean, I had, you know, when I was a child social difficulties, you know, um, which I think my, my parents helped me overcome. I always had friends, but you know, it just, as a kid, you're learning the boundaries of how to communicate with people. And that was not necessarily my strong suit. But mm. once I sort of figured that out and like, you know, became more of an adolescent, you know, it was always a situation where my parents always say, like, I, I was the social one. I was the one that had to, like, rein in, who wanted to, like, school came easy to me. I would do the minimum amount to get the maximum result. Yeah. Things that, you know, I just kind of figured out the game early, especially as it applied to something like English, where I knew how to write, I knew how to speak, I knew how to bullshit, honestly. So things like that, like, I could play the game very easily. Yeah. It's very subjective. 
math, bro. Like, there's a right fucking answer. <laughs> yeah. like, I can't. Yeah, I can't. Bullshit. I can't. Yeah. Yeah, freestyle and, and math. And so, yeah. and so, you know, I, I think that it was just something that it just conflicted with like what was in my soul, like the way that I understood things, and it was something that didn't come easily to me, and maybe I could have, you know pushed harder at that but for me it was more like well let me explore these other things and uh you know yeah my, my parents were very supportive as long as I stayed on the academic straight and narrow like I could you know fuck around and like smoke weed with my friends in the backyard and like make these movies you know mm -hmm. uh they were cool with that coolish they were cool with the making movie part. okay cool like no, no, they were definitely, they didn't act cool with it, but they definitely were cool with it. You know, like, Got it. basically, like, you know, when my father would get, like, really mad when I was in high school, like, he would be like, you know, you don't think, like, I know that you and your fucking friends are smoking <laughs> pot in our backyard, <laughs> and we're allowing this to go on. Like, you know, like, they obviously knew what the fuck was up. Yeah, like, sure, sure. And, uh, but, but no, but you're you know, still holding it down, so at least, yeah, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, you know, so I, I basically around so the first like movie technically that i ever made and finished um it was when i was uh in eighth grade i so i went to a jewish private school from elementary through middle school before then going to a public high school mm -hmm. and uh, i decided that i was going to run for student body president of this very small jewish private school and just with the way that I already was and kind of wanting to be a leader and like liking to start the club, you know, uh, we had this rule, no campaigning regarding the student election. So people's feelings didn't get hurt. And so what I did was I, I had this slogan, vote while for a smile. Everybody like the secret dap ups in the hallway. Yo, vote while for a smile, bro. Like super <laughs> on the low key. And then I had people out here wearing like, they're like, you know, like a blue, like Kabbalah band to show like, bro, like straight up like gang banging, like at this middle school, <laughs> like, you know, showing colors, like all this Ooh. shit. And, uh, so I got, uh, so I got disqualified from the wow. election and, uh, I wasn't allowed to run. And, um, yeah, the way that I processed that was my friends and I, we shot, uh, a mockumentary called the election <laughs> about the election at the school during lunch. Basically, the plot of the movie being, you know, I'm running for uh, student council president and, like, this, you know, corrupt triumvirate of, like, the principal <laughs> and, like, the vice principal, like, assassinate me. <laughs> and there's literally a scene where, like, it's like playing like we are the champions and this dude like breaks into my house and I'm running and he's got a BB gun and he like takes me down, you know, and I have this like, I'm pretty sure we use like stock footage from like, you know, JFK's funeral or something for the end. Fucking like, incredible. And we, uh, and so the school decided that they were going to have a, a film festival because they had done that in a previous year and it had been successful. And this was the only film that got submitted. And so they canceled the festival. They wouldn't show it. I actually, I actually did. No. I actually did show it to my English teacher, and she said, "This is very creative. I think this is a great way for you to have dealt with this thing that happened." But like, we can't show this, you know. Great and, response. Uh, and yeah, that thing, believe it or not, said uh, a Psycho Films production. Oh on wow! That thing. Yeah. Wow. From like 2006 or something oh, crazy. Shit. Yeah. So. From inception, it was from just... in, from inception, man. Yeah, that's kind of one of the weird, interesting things about this journey. So I made up that moniker basically when I was like, I don't even remember, like twelve years old or some shit, and have been using it ever since. And like, it sort of developed. Who would have thought now into the company it is today? And then, of course, I have no fucking clue what'll happen tomorrow. Whatever sure. will how the story will end. But yeah, it's, it's just really interesting because even. As far back as that, that was like, it wasn't just like, I want to make movies. It was like, I want to make movies and I want to have this company. I want to have this brand, this club, this cool kids club, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so I think that that is something that, you know, I've sort of had two journeys happening side by side during a lot of this, which is like this creative journey where like me making stuff and expressing myself artistically and then also this sort of entrepreneurial journey of like mm. starting this company figuring out how to motivate people starting this thing and you know kind of like building that aspect of it absolutely uh, and i love both of them honestly i think they were both 
in my soul at that time, you know, because it was like, oh, I made this movie as my creative outlet sure. and I'm gonna let you know about this brand that put it out. It was like already sure. OG marketing, you know? Mm -hmm. I love it. I wanna ask you like the endeavors of even attempting to run for class president and then also having the ability to like rally the troops to kind of create this film. You know, these are qualities of a leader in the making, right? For you, what do you think that was in wanting to run for the class president or in even like having the inkling to be able to corral the group of friends that you had to like take part in these creative endeavors, especially at that age? Uh, you know, I think part of it is you certain children crave attention. Mm -hmm. And that was certainly I just I like to be the class clown. I like to be the funny one. I like yep. to be <clears throat> the person who came up with the crazy idea and got the kids to do the stupid thing. Now I definitely had like, and still do an insane, like guilty conscience. Like I could never like really do some fucked up shit. Yeah. But oh, like yeah. in my defined world of, Oh, we're about to bust out of the lunchroom and go have this snowball fight during recess. Fuck the science teacher. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> in that shit, I was always trying to kind of rile people up. And, and I think that, uh, yeah, I don't know. That's just, uh, sort of has always been something that has has come naturally to me. And I think I've always known that in order to make a good project or a good product, like you have to have people behind you. And, you For know, sure. my, my journey, unlike maybe some other people, has not has not been one of like being by myself and like being the rogue individual who like pushes off all help and like doesn't have sure. like a squad of people like around them at all time that they trust to give responsibility to, to like support each other through, yeah. you know, the shit. And I think, uh, yeah, that's just kind of always been the way that I've wanted to approach stuff is with, you know, people who have your back. It's so important. I mean, teams are everything. It really like, is. And I mean, you need people around you to challenge you constantly and just to bring new ideas. I mean, every, like any great leader says like they want to hire people that know how to do things better than they do and hopefully you can do a lot of things better i mean that's the that's the right people to bring sure. on board but more so like you said to, to, for people to have your back um i mean that's you know you, you talk about like bringing the cool kids club and, and these things just like even as kids you have your crew you have your friends you do so we do so many things throughout our life that revolves around our friends which really just become family for sure and definitely the fact that that can't translate to work or that shouldn't translate to the work environment is almost unnatural. It's like we live our lives in this thing of we're around people, we're around our colleagues, we're around people with amazing ideas and perspectives. And then we enter the workplace and it's like, all right, I have a boss that I got to listen to. It's like, yeah, it, it goes into this weird structure that is kind of unnatural. Yeah, definitely. No, people, you know, want, uh, they want a tribe to belong to. They want yeah, that sort absolutely. of like camaraderie. camaraderie. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's like the little rascals, dude. What do they have? They're like, you know, men, boys, clubhouse. Like, For sure. you know, that's like people want to belong to something greater, even as kids, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's why kids have, you know, clubs. You can't play with us. You do this. And like, it can honestly be mean spirited as well. Like if, if misdirected, but I think it does come from that natural urge of belong and something that, you know, you arrive at philosophically if you focus on belong is you can only define belong in the context of don't belong. Yeah. And so that's naturally, you know, can create friction and can create a lot of, you know, issues because you can't say you are part of the cool kids without inadvertently saying and you are part of the losers, you know? For sure. Right. right. For sure. Interesting perspective. Absolutely. What was that? What was the transition like from going to the the school you were at to the public high school it was interesting no it was it was very interesting you know so i uh i only knew maybe like three or four kids at this high school and uh most through like jewish youth group or like other stuff like that and uh you know i don't know a, a lot of people talk about high school when I came to college, I realized that a lot of people did not have positive high school experiences, yeah. especially people who, you know, end up at a USC or more of a quote unquote prestige, whatever school, like a lot of people, you know, maybe fit into more of the nerdy category or fit into like a lot of people view college as like an escape from the, from the, you know, 
definition of themselves that they had in high school. Sure. sure. And, uh, you know, I, I certainly struggled when I came to high school in the same way of anybody not really knowing other people being the new kid. Uh, but I kind of was embraced, you know, I had this weird kid kind of artsy like mentality, but I wasn't afraid to make fun of myself and be goofy and like lean fully into kind of like Mm. being the weird movie making kid. And, um, I mean, I definitely like when I came to high school, bro, the shit that I wore freshman year, I was like literally asking to get my ass beat. <laughs> like crazy, bro. Like I used to wear this fucking, uh, it was like a, a, you know, down like North face kind of like vest with no sleeves mm. with like buttons and patches all over it for like the Grateful Dead, Pink Floyd and a fucking beret. <laughs> like, you know, and, 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 you know, it was just like. I think because I had always kind of been a class clown and could like spin it as like I was in on the joke that, you know, I was able to make friends. And then really the other thing was just, you know, once I started making these movies in high school, that became a way that I connected with people. Mm. And like when I tell you probably, I don't know, my grade at my high school is probably like 400 kids or something, you know, maybe like 1200 kids overall. Mm probably 60 to 70 percent of the kids who went to my high school appeared in one of my movies oh that's lit. in some form or another from yo we need background we need extras to yo can you play you know this part like whatever and so it was very much you know again the school was a part of what i was doing and yeah. like you know that i think obviously gave me a lot of you know ability to kind of walk within different social circles for sure uh, yeah. you know i also started smoking weed the great unifier of social groups in high school absolutely right? um, so go hang out with this type of kid go hang out with that type of kid but you know my high school i am a very fortunate everybody kind of got along i mean really? not everyone got along like there definitely were issues and fights and like but it wasn't as clicky as i had heard other people's experiences where you know like most people could pull up at any party. Like it was a very kind of open welcome sort of environment. And, uh, so yeah, I I have great memories, you know, of, of making these movies, uh, throughout high school. What I started doing was basically making feature length films. Oh, really? So I, uh, when I was a sophomore, I wrote this movie. It was called frame by frame. And it was basically a mockumentary about, these four like kind of burnouts trying to make this movie called Martin Luther King and Gandhi versus the aliens. And it's sort of like a spinal tap ask kind of, you know, movie. Uh, I cast it with like all my friends and made it for like 500 bucks, but this shit's like 82 minutes. Really? Got every kid to uh, do this part, do that part, you know, borrowed the props, like basically figured out a way. I had a camera that my parents gave me and, uh, So I made this movie. I spent about a half a year, you know, three quarters of a year making it during the whole school year, shooting every weekend, getting people to be in it, making sure I was also balancing, keeping my schoolwork up and all these things. And uh, then I decided uh, going into summer vacation that I was going to premiere it. So I got in touch with uh, the Tivoli Theater, which is this beautiful old style like art house movie theater in St. Louis. It's on the Del Mar Loop, which is like this famous uh, street in St. Louis that basically like uh, Chuck Berry owns like a bunch of d- different venues there. And it's like kind oh, of a sure. really cool arts bar district of St. Mm. Louis. And uh, they told me I could rent it out. I did like a noon showing so that I could get it for, you know, 300 bucks or something. And I literally went around and I sold tickets during lunch to this movie and I sold out the theater I paid for it like incredible you know made maybe 200 bucks or something to put toward the next one and uh yeah bro that shit is like fucking crack man like having all those people come out and watch the movie and I wore a suit and all the people who were in the movie all (laughs) taking pictures and shit like yeah that's incredible my parents their friends were there like and uh so I basically did that three more times uh, and ended up making four of these movies, basically one a year, yeah. three while I was in high school and one after my freshman year of college. That's and, fucking um, incredible. Each time grew them. The second one that I did, you know, started to work with more of like the theater kids and hunkered down on the acting more. That one uh, 
it was like kind of like a high school drama, super melodramatic, like set in the 90s. There's like, you know, fucking school shooting and kids smoking weed everywhere. And just like, mm. you know, totally a product of like what I thought was like really artsy at the time. Yeah. Um, so I made that one. And then I made one that was like a kind of supernatural, like Magnolia-esque piece. And then the last one I made was a sort of like indie kind of comedy. And uh, each one got bigger, you know, I would start reaching out to like, more of the local actors instead of just people from the high school and uh just like the city opened up for me man i mean Mm. i got access for basically free to shit that i would never even be able to get here like i shot at the police station of the suburb that i grew up in the township that i grew up in literally like putting my friends in the cells like oh wow just like shooting a jailbreak out scene just because like i talked to the chief of police and like you know i had like a reputation as being kind of like a good kid, like, you know, just like doing artsy shit. So yeah, that kind of was high school, like making these movies and like living my life and just kind of having a blast and then figuring out what to do from there, you know? Well, what was kind of like the process for you and just like the growth? Like what were you learning with each film and how was that kind of building not only your momentum, but just like your confidence and like what were, what were the things that you just took away? Like as you were going, I think a big part of it is, first of all, motivating people, Mm. getting people to feel like they're a part of something that they're going to put their effort and time into. I wasn't paying anybody. These were my friends. They were coming out because it was fun. And like that vibe had to carry into every shoot because if it stopped being fun, then my friends were going to stop showing up. You know, I mean, obviously you maybe have one or two people around you who really take the shit seriously like you do, but everybody else is like, yeah, this is fun, so we'll come and we'll do it, but like as soon as it becomes something else, you know? And so keeping people motivated was a big part of it. Presenting yourself, you know, was a huge part of it. I would just, you know, was 16 and would like write and try and seem so professional in emails that I would send to try and get access to shoot at this park or to do this thing. Yeah, And just like, you know, presenting yourself, kind of faking it till you make it, presenting myself as, oh, I'm this filmmaker, and there's a lot of shit that... I made happen in St. Louis just because I played the part, you know, like I met a reporter uh, from like the St. Louis post dispatch, which is the big newspaper here. Like she was doing a story on my high school. I ended up chatting up with her. I told her I was making this movie. She said, Oh, like when it's done, call me a year later. I called her and was like, yo, I finished this movie. It's about to premiere. So I got a write up in the post dispatch, you know, just kind of following up on that and just, yeah, keeping kind of the, the, projects moving forward problem solving dealing with like you know keeping people motivated while like shit is falling apart having to think on your feet find solutions uh that's all stuff that obviously you put into play throughout you know any creative project still to this day so a lot of those skills i think were kind of fundamental in shaping my perception of what psycho films and like you know how to get people to actually like want to put their time in uh to something that is, you know, a startup that is something that, you know, is kind of growing and isn't yet fully formed or fully defined. For sure. Were you ever feeling, well, I want to actually touch on two things, but first, did you ever feel nervous, like premiering your stuff or how is, how is this going to be um, perceived? Is this going to like, are people going to like this? That kind of feeling of acceptance that in anything you do creative one, it takes just a lot of balls to do it. Even though in the moment it feels so natural, like, oh, I'm meant to do this stuff. And then presenting it in front of people like, oh, what if this isn't like what I think it is to other people? Did you ever deal with those emotions? Yeah. I mean, I I certainly did. I think that what came back to me was a lot of love, Mm -hmm. which obviously probably was why I continued to do it and like helped me get through those times. I think that, you know... Just the fact that I was doing it like the grownups weren't going to be an asshole to the 17 year old kid and be like, well, the characters were good, but we thought the structure was lacking. You know what I mean? Like the feedback that I would get on the projects was mostly good um, because people were supportive of the fact that I was doing something. But I definitely and and I kind of knew that it would be well received because it wasn't like a room full of people that didn't know me. And the crowd certainly expanded in that sense, because as Mm -hmm. I would get more press coverage each time, you would start to see more like people just interested who had heard about it from around town come through, you know, but the last movie I did, I think had like three or four showings and, uh, 
yeah, you know, I, I don't know. The, the movies, when I look back at them, they were somebody watching great movies, having great taste in cinema, but obviously not having enough life experience to fully tie it together and make it cohesive, you know? And so I would try and make these movies that were much more mature, I think, stylistically and in terms of what their influences were and what I was trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. But like at the end of the day, I was 16, dealing with 16-year-old emotions and like a 16-year-old level of like writing abilities and things like that. For sure. Um, But I think that, you know, a lot of the movies that I love... Now, to this day, some of my favorite movies are movies that I was watching during this time. During this time of my life, I was also, like, burning through fucking DVDs, whether it was from Blockbuster, whether it was from the library. Uh, My first kind of, like, formal film education, I would say, actually came from the fact that the American Film Institute put out uh, a list of the 100 greatest films of all time (coughs) in... I think 96 was when they put out the first one. So like Fargo and Pulp Fiction were like the two most recent, but it went all the way back and it was like yeah. the 100 greatest American movies. And the summer that I was 14, I literally stayed inside all summer and watched every single one. I had a checklist Fucking and I incredible. literally went through, yeah. figured out I could get DVDs free from the library, figured out I could get one or two, you know, from Blockbuster week, whatever. And I watched every single fucking movie and that's just how I was. I had this like, I've always been interested in the art. I've also always been interested in like the culture behind the art, the story behind the art, the context, like the categorization, you know, that's just kind of like how I relate to things. So it was like, Oh, here's this list. I have to see everything on this list. Or I want to know anything about movies. Yeah. And then you see, Oh, how many great films are not on this list and this and that. But you know, that allowed me to form a foundation of seeing a lot of the classics yeah. and uh you know bless my parents they let me watch silence of the lambs and clockwork orange and like all the shit that like you know pulp fiction and all yeah. of those things because yeah, they were like rough, it's yeah. this is your this is your you love this this is your school like this is what you're you're not watching it like you know you're watching it because you love it but there's something they could tell that like I you're was taking away out from of it, it. That yeah. I was taking away from it you know what i really love outside of the fact that you were just like whether it was fearless, you were just willing to just put yourself in the trenches, is your ability to also do it with purpose and let it go, right? Because so, I feel like so many creators, you know, even later on in the stages of their creative endeavors, are so tied to their babies mm-hmm. and are so worried about, you know, what I think Joe was getting to was like, what do people think? Or like, I don't, it's not ready yet. Yeah, you can be, not, I can paralyze not, you. Yeah, it's not mixed yet. Or it's uh, with, with music, it's not mixed yet. It doesn't sound my best and no, I know I'm better. Yeah. But like the ability for you to create it, let it go yeah. and grow from it. It's one of those things where I feel like allows oneself to be able to grow far quicker than just trying to be a perfectionist without knowing what the fuck perfection really is. Yeah. Well, it was kind of impossible for me to be a perfectionist because there were certain things that I was not going to be able to overcome because I knew nothing about the film industry. Yeah. I was so far away from it. You know, I'm not... You meet kids now when you're from L.A. who grew up around the industry who could have told you what a DP or a grip or a gaffer or whatever was their whole life and were built, had been on film sets and like sure. know all those things. I didn't know any of that. I knew like, OK, I can record a camera. I can mess my way around like an editing system. Oh, my last movie didn't sound so great. So let me take this like 60 bucks that I got from summer job, you know, and get a new microphone, you know, like just trying to kind of keep things make sure everyone was looking better than the previous one right and uh that was kind of all i could focus on was just making the the next one be better and the other thing that i would do though honestly is i would always schedule the premiere before the movie was done oh nice. that's how you put the shit out yeah yeah, yeah. good you're like oh fuck i got three weeks before this is showing like all right i better like finish the shit up but they do say like you know art is never finished it's just released and i definitely (laughs) believe that you know You know, I also wanted to comment on like your ability to lean into you being that guy too. Um, I think a lot of like, just from my creative experience and creative can be wrapped up in your identity, right? You can even be playing like a character of yourself sometimes. We've all experienced this. Yeah. Every day. 
you know, and, but I think when you entered high school, I thought it was so interesting that you said, you know, you leaned in to kind of this, this kind of person, this, I'm the film, I'm the movie making guy. I'm this guy. I'm going to wear something crazy. I'm going to be this almost character. And it's those small decisions for, in my perspective that set the, the platform for you to now do this stuff because for you, you know, some people can be like the sports dude who like really fucks with film. It's like, man, I want to make film. I want, but he's so wrapped up in being the running back that it just, he's not going to go and make film because mm, it's just like, yeah. it's not even in his eye. You, you get yeah, so wrapped up. Yeah, it was my extracurricular. Up. It was the thing that I was doing. Like some people would. It was your identity. Do debate, chess club. Some people would yeah. be the president of this thing. Like I had this, I was making movies and I had this company and that's like, what I was getting, that's what my whole friend group was based yeah. in, you know? And the acceptance that comes from that early on before your product even comes out, it's like, that's what I find is so interesting is once you embrace that, everyone else can accept that. And then mm. it's like, you could put out whatever you want. You'll already, people already bought into you the first day when you weren't wearing your beret and vest. Yeah. You know what I mean? So if they bought into that guy. It's like anything you do. It was, it was, that was the other point I wanted to bring up earlier. It's like, you can keep putting things out regardless of the, the perceptions or, oh my God, is this ready? Is what are people going to think? It's like, they already bought into you because you had that ability to lean in. And I think that's such an important part of, um, it, like I said, I was telling you earlier, it's those little like moments where we make those decisions on what to do that can change a whole course of things. Mm. And that choice to just, not going to high school f afraid, figuring out, trying to fit a certain crowd, trying to like not be just the new guy and let me just acclimate to this crowd or this crowd, but say, no, nah, fuck it. I'm going to be this guy and bring it all together around this person. And also whether subconsciously or consciously, like being, no, sure. being in that moment and just letting the moment guide. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is what we're doing. This is the finished product. I'm not stopping it if I look at it and I'm like, this isn't Picot, Mona fucking Lisa. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. like, this is a film. Dope. What could be better next time? Let's roll that through the next one. Let's roll that through the next one. Just being able to be comfortable mm -hmm. in the creative process. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, just finishing one was the feat itself because, you know, again, these were movies that were between 80 and, you know, 100 minutes. That's these a are full, feature length films. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, just seeing that from start to finish, I think, like, A, was a huge part of what I took away from it. Like, mm. how many, you know, 16-year-olds say in January, like, yo, this is what I'm going to do for the next year. And then in October, like, done. You know, that that see that whole thing from the process through the writing, figuring out the casting, shooting the whole thing. You know, if I had maybe done more short films or things like that, you know, they wouldn't have required just dedicating yourself to one idea for, for that sure. period of time. And uh, yeah, I mean, I was just fucking learning, honestly. Like, I don't know how to make a fucking hour and a half long movie and like make sure that the story is cohesive. People understand what's going on. There's like characters that you can relate to and like an emotional context, you know, for people to like buy in. So mm -hmm. yeah, it was just like, it was, you know, my film school before film school. It's incredible. So yeah, it's it's, it's yeah, fucking awesome. It's 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 amazing that you took that period to dive in that deep, especially like a time where it's you're highly influential and um, you could be pulled in so many different directions, and like you just went all in on this. After high school, stepping into the real world, college, what made you want to go to USC? Was it the film school? It was a film school. So yeah. I I only applied to film school. Okay. I basically saw that as like the perfect way to like do exactly what my parents wanted, which was to get a degree, but to do it in a context that like I could define totally. and that like put me toward my goal. So I decided that I was going to go to film school. I applied to four, but USC was the one like from the second I toured it, mm -hmm. saw who had gone there, see all the sign posters in the wall. I mean, the film school, like, yeah, it's, it's designed to impress. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it wasn't, it's definitely not the cheapest school. It's mm -hmm. certainly like, you know, there are schools where I like got offered more scholarship to, uh, but I think my, my parents could just tell like that I had my heart set on it. And like, you know, I'm so lucky that they were able to work with me and help me figure out like how I could actually make that mm -hmm. a reality. 
you know, uh, cause I think that this certainly happened to people that I know you, if my parents would have told me like, Oh, sorry, you just, we can't have you go there. Like, you know, yeah, it would have like, I don't know. I, I obviously wouldn't have been here today, but also at that time, like I would have been crushed, you know, yeah. I like saw the city of gold for sure. Then of course went there for four and the gold years rush is and happening. Like saw that it was fool's gold, but still, <laughs> I saw it from that, from that time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no. So I, I was in love with USC pretty much from the second I went there. I mean, I think outside of, uh, the film school, it obviously is just like the Hollywood college image. Like when you just picture like, the college party from the movie when you picture like the college campus from the movie it's yeah, just like for sure yeah you I mean you guys both went there like you yeah, know yeah. you like get sold into like for the sure. beauty of it all and uh so yeah that was you know i have my heart set on that and then obviously i was just like so happy to see that i actually could mm -hmm. make it happen and move out to california which you know blew my fucking mind changed my life you know like i can't function anywhere else now yeah it's crazy how that happens absolutely you know what was that like moving to california so i uh i didn't have, i have one family member here my dad's uh sister and she like was always the like cool aunt but i didn't really know her super well when i was growing up you know i mean she was at all the family celebrations and things the bar mitzvahs um, the weddings yes of course of course but uh so I, I stay, when I came to visit USC, I stayed at her house. My whole parents were there. And when I figured out that I was, must have been 18, I guess. I figured out she was like really like my cool aunt. She, when I like, I was with her in the car driving back from Venice, actually here, when I found out that I got into USC. Oh, wow. So my grandfather was at my house in St. Louis picking up the mail because we were all out of town and he saw there's this big envelope from USC. Do you want to oh. open it? She called me. He opened it. I was so happy. Like I got into <laughs> USC. So fucking stoked. Oh my God. And then my aunt gave me a joint. I fucking love it. Was like, What's she, up, cool she, aunt? She, she was like, yeah, just like go smoke this before your like parents like come back. Yeah. And uh, you know, my dad actually did know what the fuck was up because like, Three days later on that vacation, he was like, have you been smoking weed with my sister on this trip? <laughs> I was like, no, what? And Michelle smokes weed? Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, but that was like my intro of California. You yeah. know, it was like... Love it. That kind of vibe. And uh, yeah, I mean, you know, USC, like, as with any college, when you move there, you're kind of restricted at first to the campus. For even sure. Even if it's a major city. Just figuring out the world, figuring out the neighborhood, like... It's a world within a world. It's a world within a world. And you slowly start to explore the L.A. that's beyond. You know, mm. at USC obviously was very close to downtown. Downtown was having this sort of like arts revival. And sure. L.A. Live had just opened when I started. So, you know, I think it was a slow progress. Obviously, like medical marijuana was like, you know, blew my fucking mind. <laughs> For sure. Um, just being at college in general blew my fucking mind so you're dealing with all of these you know big circumstances of things you haven't been independence of course blows your fucking mind yeah so like you're getting all of these things Super that you're stimulus. gonna kind of get anywhere but then you slowly start to realize what's true about la and california and like love the things about it and and now get to a point where like you go somewhere else and you're like if i go to new york I have a fucking meltdown. I like literally cannot be in New York City. I'll go like, all right, if I go for five days, the first like three days, I'll be like, fuck LA, New York, greatest city in the world. <laughs> and then by the fifth day, I'll be like, dude, I can, I got to go back to LA. I'm too yeah. calibrated to the pacing, right, right. too calibrated to the vibes, too calibrated to uh, having my own space that I can be in, you know? So like, yeah, there's there's a lot that's like so beautiful about living in LA and just things that like I think we take for granted that like enhance our quality of life or we at least think enhance our quality sure, of life for sure uh like all of the health food trends that I'm like so on of course as we all are I mean drinking my fucking kombucha here like you feel me? made kombucha salmon and steamed broccoli for dinner earlier love it you know love it yeah it's I mean I mean it's just interesting from uh a perspective of such a culture change, such a life change, even though USC is kind of like your training wheels a little bit because it is that world within a world. But as you venture out into LA and just the culture of everything, 
coming from St. Louis, um, I mean, it's, it's still a big city, and especially for film, where it's like this is, I mean, this kicks New York's ass, in my opinion. Yeah, sure. It, it must bring like such a new energy too. As you're going through film school, tell us a little about that process kind of of challenging now your expertise. Yeah. You're, you're around people who are, there's like, or just like you, right? Yeah, of course. All the guys just like you from the best in the country are coming here. You were that guy, like big fish in a small pond kind of thing. Now you're here surrounded by that. Did it challenge you in a good way? Was it tough? Was it, talk about that, uh, that kind of road. You know, one thing that I think uh, the film school at USC does very well is that they don't let you start the curriculum until your second sophomore year, year yeah. your second year. So yeah. it was like, I came to college, I dealt with all of the things that coming to college you deal with and like yeah. learning to be before I was really even able to like start super heavily interacting with the other kids in my program. I mean, you would meet someone here and there and they'd say, I had a fil- I'm a film major. Sure. When I was a freshman, I would do, you know, the little 48 hour film festival with a couple film kids, but it wasn't until my sophomore year that I really started the program. I started making movies and I got tossed into a class with, you know, people who I felt were like as creative Amazing. and, you know, motivated as me and, you know, artistic and all of those things. And, uh, yeah, I mean, the the beautiful thing about at least USC's film school is you commiserate together mm-hmm. and that's where you form the bond mm. because, you know, pretty much once you get into the nitty gritty, like, number one, your, like, ability to have a social life gets, like, super cut out because you're shooting all of your films on the weekends. So you're shooting every weekend. You're, you know, driving out to the fucking desert with your classmates to make this movie. You're kind of removed from, you're not really in many classes with general studies people because you've finished your general studies. Mm -hmm. So it's really intensive. And I think that something that USC does well, do I like it? I'm not really sure is they make it really fucking hard for you to make your movies. Mm -hmm. This is not the film school where it's like, oh, do whatever you want. We don't care. Like, just go make your thing. When I would turn in a script, I literally would get, I'd have 10 forms to fill out for, oh, there's going to be a fight scene. Someone's going to get punched. Well, do you have your stunt coordinator? We need to sign off on them. Oh, well, we're going to have, you know, a kid. Do you have your studio teacher? So they're really teaching you the production aspect. And they're making you go through the bureaucracy, uh, that honestly helped me scale and start doing projects outside because I actually learned like how to do things properly. Like you can't just point a camera at somebody's dog. You have to, if you're going to put that dog in your student film, you have to get the American humane person out there to like sign off on it. Mm. And so I think that going through that process together of sort of being really creative and wanting to be like really free and just like make your fucking art and then fighting against the bureaucracy of the faculty who's trying to, you know, make you follow the rules. It it was very challenging at times to deal with some of the things that we were sort of restricted and told needed to be a part of our process. Mm -hmm. But the people that, you know, I met there, I mean, today are a, some of my best friends B people that I still work with, uh, all the time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, on top of that, also people who would eventually become like principals in my company, you know, that's Mm -hmm. where I met the guys who now are, you know, the, the, the partners of psycho films, the main psycho films posse and all of that. Mm -hmm. So I think that, yeah, there's, there's just nothing like, you know, it's like, uh, a wartime camaraderie. Like there's nothing through like going through the trenches together, you know, to bring people together. And I think that that is something that like, I really value about having close relationships with people. Cause now I have friends, my art director who works in my videos. Like I've known this fucking dude for like nine years now, you know, mm-hmm. like that's my guy. Like that's not just somebody that I collaborate with. Like that's my brother. You know what I'm saying? Like we go back, we have history. We remember, being in the dorms, cooking up ideas, making stupid shorts, like, and now we're working on whatever, you know, music video. So mm-hmm. it, it lets you develop like a real relationship to have a creative collaboration. Absolutely. Did you ever um, struggle with the pressure of, of being in such a high intense kind of work environment that had that structure um, and also standard? I went to the, the I'll give you an example, I went to the music school at USC and you, because you're surrounded with such like intensity 
you know, people that'll kick your ass that are way better than you. Um, and you got to maintain good grades and, and go through this process. Um, in this school, it can get really tough when you have those moments of like, man, this used to be like really fun. Now it's just like really hard work and trying to find the fun in those moments or embrace those moments coming out of like, oh, I just want to be in a rock band and like perform on stage or I just want to make films with like my friends and get this person. Now like this is real and it's hard work, yeah. but in, not in the way of like hard work, I'll dedicate my weekends. It's like, ah, this is fucking draining and I'm struggling through this and it's not all fun. Yeah, no, it's very frequently it's not fun at all. Sure. But I think that if you want to make movies, like, you really, there has to be something like, you know, like masochistic, like about, you know, you're like the shit that you enjoy. Cause like, it's just one of those things outside of the product, outside of like what you actually end up making doing. Mm -hmm. Like, I love being on set and like, I love the misery of, doing two overnights, being up for 19 hours, like drinking 20 cups of coffee and smoking a pack of cigarettes, like being in the craziness of the production itself. Like for some people, you just have to love that if you're going to do it. And honestly, I think a big part of film school is figuring out who doesn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, so, Mm -hmm. so my program was film production. Mm -hmm. There's 50 kids production covers everything of the making of the movie. So it's not writing, although you do some writing classes, but it's like directing, producing, cinematography, editing, production design, all of those things. When we started, probably 70% of people first day of freshman year, if you said who wants to be a film director or film producer, raise their hand, right? Slowly over the course of the four years, people realize, oh, my student films were fun, but what I really want to do is go into post-production and go work cutting trailers or working at a post house. Maybe, oh, I actually want to go be an assistant at a a company doing development, developing scripts, or Mm. I want to go end up working at an agency. You know, I think that not everybody ends up loving production and that's fine. And that I think is part of the point of film school is to figure out, to find the thing that like, you know, is going to be a make or break for something that you actually could enjoy and stand doing. Mm -hmm. And fortunately I just always love that aspect of it. I had, since I was making these movies in high school, I love the like grind of being out there, like in the shit, making the thing. Mm -hmm. And so obviously the product has its own level of being like, you know, fulfilling, but you really, yeah, you just have to love being in the blood and guts of it all because, you know, it, yeah, it is it is brutal. Mm-hmm. But again, that relationship that that creates when you experience that with somebody, you know, that's like, then you could just do it like a hundred times over. That's why I still work with the same DPs and the same yeah. production designers and, you know, Psycho now, like, we just know how to do it. We know how to do a video. We're not worried about how to pull it off because we've done enough We've done it enough times where we know, obviously there's new challenges with every single project, but at least like we've been through the muck together. So we know how everybody's going to react. We know what people's strengths and weaknesses are. Um, Yeah. Yeah. It's just like, I think that's also where a lot of the magic happens. Like during those insane times, it's where you kind of find yourself and like where you get pushed to those boundaries in it's not like I survived this, even though that element there is, but it's like, I could actually do this for my life. Like this is my, this could be my career. This could be the thing that I've actually, I'm finding myself in this. Yeah. Um, and it tests that. And I think that's such an important thing. You, you have to be tested to find yourself. Like you said, you, you, you could have gone maybe in the other direction, you know, had you uh, maybe had different qualities. It's easy to kind of put together a film in, in high school. Not easy, like, still very hard but when you're under that microscope and under that pressure be like oh this might not be for me yeah but the fact that it happened to be it probably did it did it feel like there was just more assurance and more like strength coming out of that uh yeah i I think so i think that just obviously being there has its own level of empowerment because you're like there's 50 people who are picked you know this i'm one of the select few like shit i better like you know prove why I'm here. And uh, so I I, I think that that's definitely a big part of how you bear the burden 
you know, of the expectation. You're like, well, I'm with all these creative people. There's like a healthy competition, a healthy collaboration, everyone kind of trying to hold each other to the best ideas mm -hmm. and like to make the best work. Obviously there's judgment and it gets, oh, these, we have the same like similar aesthetic, like, oh, this person's films are so bad. <laughs> like there's definitely like some fuck shit going on, you know? <laughs> um, but like, that's the, that's the environment, you know? Yeah. And um, I think that my class overall was very close which is good and awesome. still are um i still see a lot of the people that i went to film school with even those that i don't necessarily work with but who are still very close friends of mine uh but you know the other thing that helped me i think make an identity for myself is that the second i got to film school i just like was talking the exact same shit that I was talking in high school. Oh, I have this company, Psycho Films. I've done these feature films. Like, mm. you should work on my thing. Like, trying to lay that network, trying to build that foundation. Be a part of something. Oh. Of like, you know, oh, who are these people? Who are these talented people that I get along with that yeah. could actually, we could help each other and like, we could work on similar projects and uh, develop things out. And, you know, that's really kind of how Psycho Films entered the next iteration of becoming an actual company mm. uh so you know basically i was in film school i had met uh a friend of mine donnie donnie goffstein who he was uh in my fraternity he was also a screenwriting major and he comes from like an even more jewy background than me he literally was like you know as far as his family was concerned, had gone off to like, you know, the land of sin, like Hollywood. And um, we both loved movies. We both loved like hip hop. We just like found things that we, it was very in common. And he and I uh, ended up developing this idea for a movie that he was going to write and I was going to direct. And, you know, basically it was another feature film, but this time I was like, oh, shit is different. Like I'm here in LA now. It can't, look or be like my previous films like now like i gotta you know raise the money to do this right we had these lofty ideas we're like all right we're gonna raise 300 grand you know we we're freshmen or sophomore college we're gonna raise 300 grand to make this movie uh another guy sam sam Cantor, uh who now you know is the ceo of psycho films the person who i like co-run every aspect of the business with we also met, he, you know, was very interested similarly as we were in movies and he was in the, the business school studying business and cinema. Mm. So it was like, you have this writing student and then production, and then you have this business and cinema guy. He says, Oh, how can I get involved? How can I help? Oh, sure. well, you can help us start writing the budget for this movie and figuring out that. And so very organically around this idea for a movie we had, we started to build out like a little creative team mm. and, uh, then from there, from that core kind of group of us, uh, the Jack Beggart, who's another one of the psycho principals, one of my best friends, a brilliant, you know, writer and director, uh, we met him because he and Donnie were writing a script together. And then another friend of ours was producing that. And then Sam came on to produce that. And so it was just like, you could see the connections forming mm. from four, five, six of us who, we were trying to do shit outside of yeah. school. We were saying we were going to make a movie. Jack was saying that he was going to make a TV show. Finally, we decided, you know, let's shoot some stuff from both of these. Uh, shot a sizzle reel for the movie. We raised some money and shot a pilot for this TV show idea. And, uh, you know, that was kind of how Psycho Films was really born in this current iteration. I mean, we laid heavy finesse. We got somebody to give us a red camera for free for two weeks during spring break to shoot all this shit. We, you know, got a few grand from various people to like make these projects. And uh, yeah, that was like, you know, we really had to play the part. Actually, funny enough, uh, so Jack, when we started doing, when, when I came on to start working on his uh, TV show, which is sort of what kind of merged and solidified the core Psycho crew, he was really close with Donnie, who we were both writing stuff with and like, Sam then started working with them. And I remember specifically like, they were like, yo, you should hit up Joe. Like he'll be able to help you like talk legit and like get, you know, pull the money down, like make sure everybody feels kosher about the situation. And Jack was like, yeah, but like these psycho films guys, like, I don't know, like they have their own thing, like, you know, whatever, like <laughs> I don't want them to touch this shit. And like now, you know, got him. 
<laughs> got him. Got him. Got him. But uh, yeah, so you know that's kind of the the crew kind of formed very organically. We shot uh, my sophomore year over spring break uh, a bunch of stuff. We had all of the kids who were in film school, the production kids, like just stay in LA for spring break, and like gave many of them honestly their first taste of like really producing something outside of the classroom yeah. and like doing it in such a way where it was like a product that like everybody felt again, insanely motivated to be yeah. a part of. It was fun. It had that same rhythm and that same vibe. Yeah. And so basically based off of those experiences, we got legit and we were like, yeah, let's just start a company, like actually make psycho films, like mm-hmm. register it with the state of California, totally. make it an LLC, make it a business, make it something that, you know, uh, I, I think we actually did that in the process of getting some of these checks, you know, from various people. Cause it was like, well, if you're going to finance, you know, even if it was like so-and-so's uncle or whatever, like if you're going to finance a project, you gotta have a legit company that you can sure. cut the check to and all of that. So, you know, we basically built the business around these creative projects and, uh, had very, I think lofty ideas of what we were going to do with those projects But the other thing that we, you know, had that now sometimes I try and even get back to, we had no fucking shame about literally like meeting somebody and like being like, yo, do you have a million bucks to finance our movie? You know what I'm saying? Just making crazy ass like, oh, so-and-so's dad is some producer at USC. Oh, do you think your dad would be down to like read our script? It's the freedom of being a student almost. Yeah, it's the freedom of being a student and the freedom of no stakes. And so it was like, we had nothing to lose. We could, you know try and enact these massive finesses. We talked a big game, told people, yo, we're going to be big. Like this is like around the time where we met. I mean, you know how we were acting. For sure. We're about to be, we're about to be hot shit. For sure. I actually remember for, uh, for this pilot we did, this is a great story. We wanted to get a rapper to cameo in the pilot. And, uh, two things sort of happened. One, uh, which ends up paying off later. We met a dude from TDE, uh, Hollywood. And this is like right around, obviously when like, you know, this is 2012, like mm-hmm. 2011, like right around when like Kendrick and Schoolboy and everyone are taking off. And he told us he was going to get them in the pilot. <laughs> and literally like there's Facebook posts from us from like 2011 being like, Oh yeah, Kendrick is locked. He's about to be in the shit. Like, <laughs> and like eventually when we ended up working with him, like we were all laughing about it. Just I like, love like, it. Yeah. <laughs> but, but the person that we could get, uh, for a thousand bucks was Riff Raff. Oh, nice. And, and so Love we were like, all right, we're going to shoot this cameo with Riff Raff. He amazing. pulled up to one of our friends' houses. Like, we had all the accoutrement he could possibly want. Like, everything was ready to go. We shot with him for like 40 minutes, and it was just like so kooky and crazy it was just like you know he pulled up he scraped the fuck out of his car was having like a meltdown i mean this was the first this was was like the first like celebrity like you know that we have like fucking interacted with on this level and this dude like he was pulling up on like menlo you know he was like just like pulling into some like shitty west adams house i forget like how we even knew his manager was some weird finesse but we ended up shooting this dude and uh love it yeah you know so so those were just the times and then you know from there, we're like, oh, well, what do we do? Yeah. You know? That's fucking awesome, though. How'd you start building, you know, especially like working with friends and working in that environment? Like, naturally, everybody has this common goal and vision. Um, how did you guys all gel in terms of responsibilities, like understanding delegation and just like building for the common goal? Naturally, everybody isn't going to be putting in as much as everybody wants them to so how do you deal with that kind of ebb and flow of who wants it who doesn't and who who feels like they're a part of something and who really isn't you know right these these things become like friendship and business but like when people are going after a goal and a dream it really like you have to be selflessly selfish sure you know what i'm saying yeah and i mean it's it's not like you know we haven't lost friendships because of business shit. Like that's just part of life and Mm -hmm. part of like having a business where you like have friends, especially, especially in the college days, because in the college days, you're right. Like at first it was like, Oh great. Everybody's like a part of this thing. And then it's like, okay, but this is a real thing. So like who is gonna really be a part of this? Who's giving value? Like who is the core? And then who is the next? Like, you Mm -hmm. know? And so that obviously, you know, 
created can create, you know, struggle and create feelings and things like that. I think, you know, for, for the main kind of squad, first of all, everybody has different skill sets, right? So like, you know, and you can even see that in the majors, you have, you know, a couple guys who are in the business school. And so obviously they were more in charge of like handling the finances and like doing the business aspects. You have like people like me and Jack who like are in the production. So we're going to be doing more of the creative and the producing. You have people who are more specialized in post or a writer. So I think that, you know, naturally we kind of used our skill sets, uh, to try and complement one another. Sure. But a lot of it honestly was me and Sam, my business partner, like figuring out how to balance every, like how to make sure that all the chaos was happening and it was going toward like an ultimate end goal. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the strengths of psycho films, but particularly just any venture starting out, like for having capable people and not just having to be one person is that, one thing that enabled us to climb is that we could take on many projects at once, you know? And I think that that's still something that, you know, sets us apart, maybe not from like the bigger production companies, but definitely from the other people who are trying to start up production companies is we can put out work. We can have five videos going in production, you know, at once. Uh, And so I think that part of that was figuring out, okay, so Jack is going to focus creatively on this thing. And then I'm going to focus on this thing. And like, we're going to make sure that all the products are the best they can be. And then they all kind of come back in this reel where we show off, you know, what we've done. And like, that was pretty much, you know, what inspired our turn into music videos was realizing that we needed to produce content and like have projects and find stuff to do and show people what our aesthetic could be. Mm. Because I think that one of the hard lessons coming out of you know getting toward like the end of college was well shit nobody gave us 300 grand to make this movie like (laughs) nobody want hbo didn't want to buy our fucking pilot that we made when we were like 19 like well how do we pivot you know like we definitely we had a failed kickstarter we had you know mentors that we had fallings out with like Mm. we had to reassess but the thing that we love to do was make stuff and uh we love music as well and so you know around that time it just sort of naturally the projects that started coming to us were music videos Mm -hmm. and uh, we started working with uh, another guy who you know uh is a principal in psycho to this day christian and christian he was a a former football player at sc and um was in the same major as sam the business and cinema major but you know basically came on to help with the music video thing he knew a couple artists you know there was like this French, uh, the French connection we call him, but like a friend of ours at school who was, uh, had like a bunch of French rappers that he was messing with. So he brought them out and we did a video and, you know, we just started doing these small, basically no budget videos. We had the LA downtown arts revival going on at that time. So we were getting plugged up with random people. Uh, we met an artist by the name of Logan who we ended up doing a video for literally met him like when he was, you know, just like staying on his mom's couch now you know he's like being placed in insecure and shit like that you know what i mean just seeing people that you wouldn't necessarily have heard of at the time for sure just if we fucked with the music and we had a good idea we were just gonna make that product and one thing i think that you have like whenever people ask me like yo how do you make your first few low budget videos stand out to eventually possibly lead you down to something else Mm. One resource that you have when you are making a video for an undiscovered artist that you're never going to have again is time. Now when I do a video, I got one, maybe two, if I'm super blessed, three days to work with the artist. Yeah. But with this dude, we could hang out with him anytime we wanted. So we literally shot like 30 days on this video. (laughs) So many different locations. We would shoot a piece and edit it. Also, there's no timetable. There's no label saying, yo, you need to deliver this in 10 days. We would spend months finessing the edit, making sure we had everything right. And so we really took time with those early products to develop things that would eventually become part of the Psycho kind of brand of Mm -hmm. what we're known for in terms of like the visual effects, the editing style, just like these different things that we were sort of honing. And uh, they also had exposure through USC's kind of like community in the downtown arts community because there was just so many art shows going on at the time uh around los angeles and actually 
uh, one of our friends from USC, he was the host of one and he was the curator of one. So Mm -hmm. he basically was getting like warehouses and then throwing these events that are called LA Renaissance. And basically you would go and there would be a dance performance and a jazz band and a hip hop performance and like a few painters selling work on the walls. Mm -hmm. And then they would show a psycho films video. We would just bring out a projector and show our videos. And, uh, I think we did two or three of those before we were at one. We showed a video that we had just done and, uh, we were approached by hit boy and that's like kind of where everything where we are to this day started. That was like, again, one of those, one of those moments hit basically approached us and was like, I see you guys are young guys doing really creative, cool shit. I'm looking to, you know, vibe with like young creative guys and like, have you, you know, just come hang around the house and like, see if, you know, maybe shoot some BTS or something. And we're like, freaking the fuck out and this is the biggest person that we've ever met it's like hit boys work with kanye's work of course jay-z blah 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 like and uh that became like one of our strongest probably our strongest and most important like friendship i mean that's the person who discovered us like if you want to ask me like forever because he really we were doing tiny videos sure and he brought us up to the house we hung out with him like every day for like you know three four five six months every day somebody from psycho was going up there with a camera and because he was a producer he's bouncing around studio to studio never once being like y'all can't come this awesome. isn't chill we were literally at his hip he would go in the studio with diddy we would just be there shooting he would go in the studio with yg someone would be there shooting and a lot of we were trying to use those opportunities to get in front of those people and like show them, you know, yo, we're going to do your videos, blah, blah, blah. And they're kind of looking at us like, whatever, like yeah. who is this like hit boy BTS crew? Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> later down the road, like it that really, access is it, fucking invaluable. The, the access yeah. was crazy. And later down the road, because we had met people in that context, they honestly like, viewed us as little bros that like they were proud of right. like they could watch our journey and be like wow i remember meeting you guys in the studio yeah at hit boys you telling me yo watch this video like yeah. and so that visibility in the progress and the mm. process especially because people met us when we were 21 22 years old i think has been a really big part of you know how we've been able to foster those relationships because people know that we didn't come from anything handed to us that we didn't come from you know we're not industry plants like that we really were out here grinding like meeting people being in the studio like hanging out being around the vibe loving the music it's also a subconscious veil of trust because hit boy has this integrity and level with Mm -hmm. that squad and that group of people yeah and just the fact that like he's allowing you guys to come on like just by association instant credibility instant credibility yeah no, a hundred percent. And uh, yeah, naturally, so, that you have to build on, but like instant credibility yeah, just like yeah. bailed. Well, you have to rise to the opportunity for sure. Yeah, 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 for sure. And how did you guys like? Was there a conscious moment of like, yo, we can't fuck this up, or was it just like, hey, we're on and we're just gonna keep doing what we do and grab this by the fucking bull by the horns and, and go for it? You know, it, it was just one of those things where, first of all, it was fun and. Mm. It was definitely not low pressure, but it, we had a lot of like opportunity to explore creatively during awesome. those days. We were literally just honestly shooting Hit Boy like with his friends in the studio and then cutting together shit that never got released. Little goofy video where we take them and put them on the 2K graphics. You know what I mean? Just doing different effects, sure. honing kind of just like fun stuff. They're like, they just, they liked watching. They liked what we were doing. So we kept doing it. And that eventually led into us doing two music videos for him. Dope. And that was like, so it was like, oh, we've been doing this BTS. We've been pitching videos. Finally, we're going to do some. And so we did two videos for him. Uh, this was, we were in college. This was maybe my senior year. And uh, yeah, that, you know was again like another stepping stone in production value where it's like, oh, now we're making videos for an artist that this is going to get in all the publications. Like this is going to be seen. Like people have eyes off of, you know, 
what where this product is going. Yeah. And so again, it was like something that we don't really always have the the luxury of doing now spending that time this was the only thing we were focused on yeah. and it was like we have to make these two low budget videos the best fucking videos anyone has ever seen yeah and like what we had going for us was it was our friend and we knew his sensibilities and he believed in our creative vision yeah and like it was just great vibes and it's just somebody who like you know we just kind of click with for sure. And so those videos basically, you know, ended up being a ton of fun to make. And we were very happy about the product. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, basically, you know, based on that, like the Kendrick shit happened pretty much as a direct result of, you know, I mean, I can never know for sure, Yeah. but I know that it came through hit. Like I know that mm. he's the one who gave them our number. And so I don't know how, Yeah, I don't know what that conversation was. I don't know. Like, was there a video scene? And then it was this, like what that, but like, I know that that call came in and we were like, wait, what, you know, what the fuck was that like? Uh, it was, yeah, it was crazy. It was crazy. I mean, uh, to pimp a butterfly had literally just come out like three weeks before. Yeah. And, and, and this is really like, no, this, <coughs> this is truly, uh, one of those like moments for me where my understanding of the universe expanded. I remember when that album came out, listening to it and being like, dude, how crazy would it be if we did a video off of this? And then it literally, came into existence you know um but yeah so so that you know uh suddenly the stakes got very real yeah and suddenly it's like now this is an opportunity that if we fuck up this is the biggest you know the biggest opportunity we're ever going to get handed probably at you know we knew we were very prepared now here's the thing we knew that something like this was going to happen. Mm -hmm. We didn't know it was going to be this person who's at this top, you know, king yeah, yeah, level. Yeah. yeah. But we knew eventually we're going to get an opportunity for a fairly well-known artist from this situation that we're in. Yeah. And like, here's how we have to be. Here's how we're going to grow the company. At the time, also, we were getting ready to graduate. So we started to think about, you know what the next iteration of the company was going to be. We'd all been living uh, essentially in like the same house on Menlo, like a 12 bedroom house on Menlo. Graduation is looming. We have these opportunities. We're trying to figure out, you know, is psycho films going to basically like sort, you know, survive and be like a thing that we Are all we pursue to, collectively. Yeah, like, like, yeah. Job, yeah. Is this going to be our job? Yeah. And, uh, you know, through that crazy experience, we basically within, you know, um, I had graduated a semester early, but for the rest of the guys, basically within a week of graduation had shot these Kendrick videos. Half of the people were homeless because we had been like basically like kicked out of the first house, but everyone's like trying to figure out like where they're going to go next, like trying to get the nightmare lease situation in L.A. Yeah. Closed the first round of financing in our company, got an office on Melrose and moved in, which is where we are to this day. Fucking and bro. this literally happened in like a two week period. Oh, fuck. And uh, yeah, it was crazy. It was just like one of those things where yeah. it's like suddenly crazy timing. Oh, fuck. Like yeah. crazy timing, but all things had to happen. Yeah. 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 Like, no, it starts had to be, align. Yeah. You know, you don't. It couldn't get, you not happen. You don't get the investment without the video and yeah. you don't kill the video without the background, you know, the structure that you set, like it all kind of happens. Mm -hmm. But that whole experience, yeah, was obviously insane. And suddenly it was like, whoa, our shit is on media takeout. Like it's le people are leaking, you know, stills from the video. Like we just saw, obviously we're in a new kind of like lane of where our products would get exposed to yeah. and like how they would get out there. And I think that, you know, that, when those videos came out, um, we started to see people reaching out to us, artists being like, I'm so proud of you guys. Like, 
I just saw the Kendrick videos, you know, like I remember meeting you guys like, this is great. Like we should do something, you know, like yeah, suddenly yeah. it was like all the floodgates were open. Yeah. Everyone who we had, you know, met previously in the studio, you know, from the YGs to the Puffs would all, you know, be people that we ended up collaborating with. There would be new people who we had never met, but who had seen our work. We would start to play the label game. Like we just doubled down on the music video thing. Of yeah. course, the big question was, all right, you guys had like, you know, one shot, big video. Can you keep doing it? Can mm -hmm. you keep getting those jobs? Can you keep working with those artists? Can you keep the quality of the product up? Sure. And uh, so we just kind of, you know, pivoted and just kind of committed everything into that because it was just like, you know, we got to build. This is how you build a portfolio that mm -hmm. people pay attention to. We have sure. the platform now. If we don't fuck it up, <clears throat> we keep the work out there. Like, and we have this culture and this brand. That's like where all the world, that's the sweet spot where it all merges, you know, where it's like we have this product that we're very proud of and we feel like competes, you know, at a higher level than necessarily like what you might think, you know, based on the size of our company and how long we've been in the game. At the same time, we have a vibe and an energy that like was still part of this college recklessness. It was still like just part of, you know, like, fuck it, no stakes. Like, let's just do the thing let's embrace the crazy and like let's go out and try and you know the little homies. make something out of this yeah. you know and uh so yeah so we got this office on melrose and kind of made psycho films another step more legit you know and that mm -hmm. was like another kind of turning point so yeah that uh and that kind of whole experience and journey then led to you know a lot of the things that would kind of, you know, bring me to where I am today in terms of my personal journey because, you know, until until that time, I had probably never questioned anything like in my life. I mean, yeah. I had questioned shit, sure. Yeah. But like from when I was 12 and I made up Psycho Films till like I dropped this video with like the biggest artist in the world on the biggest project, whatever – Maybe there were hard times, there were setbacks, but like the combination of that comfort level of being in school and being in a time where you know you're supposed to be fucking up, yeah, yeah, having yeah. low stakes, feeling like fully desirous of a thing that I didn't know if I would ever get, mm -hmm. I had no question. Yeah. And then I got that fucking thing and then it's like, oh, well. Who am I? You know, who am I? And also, you know, I mean... When you have like something like that premiere, it's like it took me back to that first premiere that I was saying, you know, yeah. the 300 people like in the theater, mm -hmm. except this was fucking a million people the first day watching sure. it. And this was, you know, instead of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, Rolling Stone and Pitchfork and all these places. And like, you know, in many ways, I was like one of the greatest highs like I've ever felt like that was the point of in many ways me doing the thing i mean obviously i love the work and i love the craft but part of me always like the reason i had anchored my identity in it mm -hmm. is obviously because i knew that i would have pleasure tied to it i knew that i would feel good to be recognized by other people and to have stuff out there and i thought that that was something that i really really wanted yeah and not that there are aspects of that of recognition and things that i don't embrace and like love the feeling of but very quickly you learn if you tie your actual personal happiness mm. to that feeling mm. that you have no control over, mm. yeah, like you're fucked. <laughs> like, fucked. You know, that's, fucked. that's a yeah. Because you don't, you know, you're gonna have times when you hit that, but you're gonna have yeah. other times where you're just like trying to figure your shit out. And uh, you know, I think that that was kind of the ebb and flow that you know I sort of had to start to feel out. You know, I mean, when when I had that video come out. I thought, oh, great, this is my life now. Yeah. Like, I'm going to be getting hit up by all the biggest people. I'm not, yeah. it's just, I'm not going to have to put the you made work it. in. Like, yeah, exactly. You made it. Cool. And then you just yeah. realize, like, well, not really. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. I mean, it's crazy when we realize, like, whether whether it's brand or career. And when you, when you mix these things and identity, like, so many of us literally tie our worth with our job or our career or if you're an artist like our brand right and then there comes a point when it's like 
that is a thing, but that that doesn't lead to self worth or happiness, right? There comes a moment in in everybody's life where, whether it's a catastrophic event or just like an epiphany in life, where regardless of whether things are going great or not in a career, it becomes like hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. I'm not defined by this. This is a function of me. Who am I? Right? Where we have to take this kind of self-reflective approach that I feel like so many of us never get the chance to. Yeah. Right? Because we're constantly going on this like, all right, cool, this is me, this is me, this is me, this is me, until it's not. Mm -hmm. But w was there a moment for you where you were like, holy shit, like, this is all great and everything, but... I need to take a moment for myself. Yeah, I, I think there was a slow building toward that realization. So basically, I shot this video. I directed this video in May. And uh, then immediately after, I did uh, a video for Black Hippie, you know, Kendrick Schoolboy, J-Rock, Absol. Yeah. That was like the first Black Hippie video that had been done in five years. Yeah. And so again, that was like another super validating opportunity. Yeah. I was very happy with how the project turned out. At the same time, Psycho, Jack is doing videos. Like we're just starting to flex a little more of our like creative muscle. Uh, I ended up getting the opportunity at the end of that year to go to Dubai and to shoot a job that I honestly wasn't ready for. And it wasn't a music video. It was uh, a basically uh, an unscripted pilot. And uh, it was a pretty big opportunity. And there are some things that were out of my control, certainly, in terms of like the other people who are involved in the production mm -hmm. outside of the psycho people. Yeah. But at the same time, I just also <clears throat> was thrown into a world with executives who are like in their fucking forties and like politicking and playing the game. And I'm like this 23 year old kid who like is feeling himself off of doing these Kendrick videos and like, doesn't really know how to deal with all this shit. Sure. Yeah. And so I literally found myself in Dubai, like, <laughs> having been awake for like 10 days while all this shit is like falling apart mm. and just coming like so close to like, you know, having like a total meltdown. Now, fortunately, like there were other people from Psycho there who were like supporting me and like, you know, obviously experiencing the bullshit as well, but I was like the director, so it kind of like fell on me. Yeah. But I also, you know, was making some reckless decisions and just like, you know, kind of living that life and... uh yeah, so so I came back from that trip. I was in Dubai for 21 days, uh, which is too long to be in the UAE. <laughs> it's too long to be in the UAE without a day off. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's too long to go without smoking <laughs> weed. Yeah. And you don't smoke weed there. Yeah, so, sure. uh, so I came back and um, yeah, it definitely was a moment where I was like, well, fuck, like. It's not all, not every job is going to go great. And like here, I had to learn a bunch of shit and like humble myself from the experiences that I had there and be able to analyze like what went wrong that was circumstance, what went wrong that was my fault, like what I should learn from even the things that weren't my fault. Sure. Like what do I do with this experience? And uh, very, very fortunately, two weeks after I got back, I got a call from Diddy to do a video for them and that I would say at that moment like saved my confidence in a way because mm, yeah. then I could be like I still got it though still, <laughs> you know what I mean like yeah fuck this Dubai shit but like yeah. you know no, I still we got the sauce yeah mm. so um so yeah so at the end of 2015 I uh, yeah basically got hit up to do this video for Puff um the whole experience of making that you know, you know the the music thing it's weird because the way that you do it is you basically bounce around to different camps and so when i think about like you know the timeline of like the last couple years like okay december 2015 to like january 2016 that's when i was with bad boy that's when i was like around them all the time like collaborating working on the project because i got literally you know had this video yeah so they hit me up and they said, we need a treatment in four hours. Oh, beautiful. Fuck. And we need to shoot it in three days. 
my approach was basically like, all right, I'm just going to write every idea I have and then let them come back if they like it and say, oh, we like this one. We don't like this one. Just kind of like, let's overload with the ideas because that's like the craziest timeline I've ever had. Like you <laughs> literally need something immediately. For sure. So I uh, sent this treatment, get a call back the next day. Yo, you should come up to the house and meet with Puff and see if you guys vibe. Uh, so I came up with my producing partners and uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was funny, man. I love Puff. Yeah. That's like, you know, it's a great dude. What was the vibe like? The vibe was, uh, obviously we were nervous. Obviously this is digital. For sure. Like yeah. 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 Like yeah, invented yeah, yeah. music videos as we know them. Also kind of invented music videos that like the psycho films brand was trying to deconstruct. Right. Mm. That was like one of the interesting things is psycho films is about how do we reinterpret or remake the music video. Even when we do use things like the cars and the girls and the tropes sure, that you sure. associate, how do we do that in a new interesting way? Yeah. Well, here's the dude who literally invented that. Mm -hmm. Here's the dude who branded the party image of hip hop facts. And, um, yeah, so so the you know we were nervous and we came in and talking to his management team and telling them the story, which obviously the story of Psycho Films, which of course they love, you know, hearing that we all grew up together, not grew up together, but came you yeah, know in college, this, yeah, and yeah. Went through USC together, met in film school, and all these things, and uh, then uh, yeah, the the vibe was good. It was just like let's talk about the idea. Let's blast the song and have a good time. It was the night that Star Wars The Force Awakens came out and we actually missed our showing that we had tickets to <laughs> to go to meet with Diddy. And then we told him that and he was like, oh, well, let's just rent out the iPick right now. Like, let's just go see Star Wars. Fuck. And um, literally Sam, like, he couldn't order the tickets fast enough on his like phone and we're like dude like we literally could have just gone you know to fucking rent out the iPick and like see see the new star wars with diddy that would be legendary but it's all good because we got the video um we ended up shooting it like literally two days before christmas and then as we were rapping like essentially as like a real offer but like you know some like secondhand comment puff was like oh yeah and if you guys are in miami for new year's like we're having a party and so me and my producer were like okay we'll be there <laughs> like, so we so we literally like we shot this video we're in post for a few days then we literally fly to miami for new year's with no place to stay like we're just like we get the tickets we'll figure it out when we're there we'll call you know one of puff's managers obviously like they bring everybody out, so they had a block of rooms at whatever hotel. So we yeah. knew that like somebody wasn't gonna show up. We could finesse a room. Yeah. So we ended up snagging a room like in the like, you know, bad boy block of rooms at Love whatever it. like hotel we were at. And uh yeah, so I did New Year's twenty fifteen into twenty sixteen at Puff's house. Fucking and lit. uh yeah, man. It was uh it was a time. I feel <laughs> that it was a time. Yeah, actually it was funny. Yeah. I uh I met uh, the weekend that weekend and it was in the context of like, you know, everybody just being like drunk as fuck. And, uh, my producing partner, Christian, like trying to finesse and work the party and being like, yo, yo, like Abel, come here, come here. Like, I want you to be my boy, like Joe Weil, like this is my dude. And the weekend is like, dude, I've known Joe Weil for 10 years. <sighs> Just on some drunk shit. Like, you know, like, <laughs> like this girl had never seen me in his life. Like, oh, definitely not. Joe. Like, like, yeah. He's like, yeah, dude, I've known up, this guy. Up. Yeah, exactly, no, exactly. Years, yeah. But, uh, like middle school. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so that was how my 2016 ended. And so it was sort of this, like, crazy, like, low time with Dubai. Then coming back up to this puff shit. Then, like, going back down into, like, a lull production period where there were, like, a few months where, like, we weren't booking anything to then getting <laughs> jobs again and just like sort of going on this journey, like real, that's what made me kind of like start to realize this is not, this is not a sustainable thing to tie your fulfillment to mm. because like you can't chase that feeling like you can't control what people are going to want to work with you. Like you can't control For sure. what your timing is going to be. Your timeline is going to be. Sure. And so like, that's really, you know, when I started to kind of explore like 
what could be inward and mm. honestly get control of my life in other ways. Like I lost like 30 pounds, you Incredible. know, around awesome. that time just awesome. because like weight was something that I had always kind of struggled with. I had always like, you know, since I was a kid been like chubby and like, you know, definitely didn't live like many people didn't like the healthiest lifestyle in college. But like, you know, I just personally have the like body type that responds poorly to, you know, treating your body like shit. Like, you know, For sure. uh, I wasn't blessed with that speedy metabolism, you know? <laughs> and, um, so I went, uh, I went cold Turkey paleo for like 90 days. Oh, I stopped wow. drinking. Um, I just kind of like went on a total, awesome. you know, kind of binge, Cleanse. purge. Yes, not a binge, a binge of positivity, a yeah. purge of some of these things. And uh, yeah, I don't know. That's that's kind of when I really started to like learn and like think about like Buddhism and just like sort of like a lot of this Eastern philosophy that I sort of found myself mm. being drawn to. Yeah. Uh, for me, it was in the, in the form of books. I mean, that's how I learned about it. And uh, books is books have been something that like we haven't really talked that much about this, but that's like the other foundation of my like life. Like really? it's like movies and music and books. Mm. I read like a book a week. Mm. Um, oh wow! I try to at least, uh, especially like it's hard when you're in college. Obviously, like to actually for read. sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like now, you know, I pretty much try my goal is to read fifty two books a year. Incredible and. Uh, They've just been something that like I've always absolutely loved. That's like where I've found when I was a kid, I was always, you know, a bookworm. And that's where I've found <coughs> like a lot of my inspirational artistic moments. Yeah. I, I think that there's, you know, there's this artistic feeling like that you get when you're like affected by like a great movie or like you hear a part of a song. At least for me, I have this where like there's a moment in a movie where something happens, like especially as a creator mm -hmm. that I like understand is like so brilliant from this director that it sure. literally gives me this like transcendental experience. Mm. And I've had that with music too. Like the first time that I heard like dark side of the moon, you know, definitely like fucking blew my mind. <sighs> and, uh, I have that same experience, like with a great book. And so for me, it was like, Oh, this is something I want to learn about. I want to learn about, Buddhism, how do I start accessing this? Mm. Well, who, you know, are the great kind of minds that have commented on this uh, and sort of brought Buddhism to the West and like what have people searched for before who are looking and dealing with questioning like the purpose of their life. And uh, yeah, it, it ended up, you know, philosophically clicking with me in a lot of ways because I think that the idea... The foundation of Buddhism is, of course, that like the root of all suffering is desire. Mm. And basically what that means is that you want something in your life. You believe that you're entitled to something. You have an expectation sure. of how your life should be. And when that doesn't get fulfilled, you suffer because yeah. you desire it so badly. Yeah. And if you desired nothing and were totally complacent with what you had, you would be fulfilled. Fact. And so, you know the eightfold path of the Buddha is a path to end desire and thus end suffering. But you do that by realizing that life is suffering mm -hmm. and that you're powerless to really, you know, affect it. And so all you can do is basically like come to try and, you know, come to a place where you're just fully living in the presence mm -hmm. because, you know, the mind, this is something that you, you find a lot in like, Zen Buddhism and like Taoism, it's this this line: the mind cannot grasp the mind. Mm. Like as long as you think about thinking, you're going to be stuck in this trap. Trust. As long as you think about the meaning of what you're doing and try and like base it on this ego construct that you have, and like if you try and contextualize everything in your personal definition of what your identity is, like. You're just never going to be happy because you're constantly going to be holding experiences up against one another, trying to contextualize things, trying to feel like you deserve something more. This is not the way things should be. Yeah. And uh, so this idea of doing things like without attachment, I think, is is something that I don't know how well I put it into practice. Yeah, but these are certainly yeah. things that I think about. For sure. And now, one of the reasons I think about them is because I struggle with them. Yeah. I think that there are people like, you know 
there's like a, a famous like Zen riddle. It's like, does a dog have Buddha mind? Because all the, when the dog is hungry, it eats. When the dog is tired, it sleeps. When the dog has to shit, it shits. Like a dog does not think about, I am a dog. Right. It doesn't have this ego. It doesn't have this like consciousness in that way. For sure. And I think that there similarly are people who maybe are just naturally happy-go-lucky and actualized and enlightened. They're just people who go through life and they don't think about the meaning because they are just fully like, you know, fulfilled by the present. Mm. But that just isn't me. I personally like have questioned and have found times where I'm like trying to figure out what the fuck the meaning of all of this is mm -hmm. and like do think about those things. And so I think for those of us who, for those of us who seek, you know, it's comforting to like realize that people have found these questions before. Yeah. And then of course the other thing is that the wisdom is so ancient. Mm. That's something else, you know, there's a big difference though between seeking answers and seeking understanding. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I really, one thing that I really love about the Eastern religions is that it focuses on internal and self. You know what I'm saying? Cause like so many, people especially in like the western world attribute happiness to things and attaining things yeah. and levels of things where you know even if we just like ask ourselves what makes us happy right without any consideration for things it's like happiness really comes from within ourselves you know what i'm saying i was talking Certainly. to one of my boys the other day and he was telling me a story of it's crazy i got a text from him he was in europe He's like, bro, I just signed the biggest record label, uh, record deal of my life. He works with a few artists. He's like, I have the best wife a man could ask for. I have the most beautiful child you could ever imagine. And I'm not happy. I, I don't feel great. I don't even feel good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's like, I need to talk. Right. And we got together. Um, and he was listing off different things that were going on and just like, bro, like these aren't bringing me joy. And I was just like, I asked him, I was like, what brings you happiness? And he paused and he was just like, my family does, right? And I'm like, in this whole path of attaining and you've literally spent your whole life to get to this moment and just figured out that like this does not bring me Fuck. the incredible joy. He's like, bro, I signed the deal. I thought it'd be champagne everywhere. Everybody's yeah, wilding out. He's like, bro, I was alone in my hotel room. Yeah. No, that's, right? that's the exact same experience that I went through like, with these videos that came out. Where yeah. It's like you finally get the thing that you, you fantasize you about yeah, what this shit is going to be. But that's where the questioning starts because yeah. you spend all of your time, like you form a narrative and like until it happens, it's very easy to just say, oh, this is the thing I need. I'm just so motivated to go toward this yeah. one goal. Once uh, I get that, I'm good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then. And you realize you, know, you get there and there's more. You and, know that, what I'm and that that is actually like nothing yeah you know it's, it's a pit it's stop it's and literally bro but like not to cut oh, you yeah, off no, no. but like he answered he was like fam my family yeah. right and i was like in all of this hoopla have you thought about them are your actions towards building your career which you need to do but are basing all of your fucking like happiness on or are you focusing on making them happy, thus making yourself happy? Right. And that was like a humongous shift for himself. You know what I'm saying? We started talking about like what his wife wants, like what he wants for his kids. And he started realizing there was such a big gap in what he was doing for his family. Not to say that he was neglecting it, but it was like there was so much more that he could be doing that would bring him way more happiness, right? And like just that shift. It, it was crazy for me to see even because like a lot of times, bro, even as friends, we can talk to each other and like give each other the best advice, but like we're also seeking it, right? So many times I find myself giving advice because I genuinely listen and speak my perspective to my friends that I'm talking to myself. Yeah, through of them, course. Right? Advice is hard to, what is it? Hard to give, easy to give and hard to take. Absolutely. Right. But like I saw this spark in him and I was just like, bro, like, it, it it really like just like continued to to revitalize and just like hammer on the fact that everybody's happiness is individualized and unique and the more and more we start to ask ourselves what brings us personal happiness the more and the closer we get to finding it 
Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And it does not come anywhere from outside of ourselves. No, it, it mm-hmm. comes from within, you know, uh, in, in Hinduism. So uh, the Upanishads, are, there are several books of wisdom. They're some of the foundation of Hinduism, but also just of kind of world religion and philosophy. This is like one of the most ancient sort of like religious texts that we have. Mm-hmm. And uh, in Hinduism, the self and the Godhead are indisputable. They're used in this text, basically, you can replace one for the other, you know, because the self going deep into the self and questioning this entity of what I truly am, that is like the manifestation of like the all powerful, like that is where we draw like all of our experience and like all of our energy from. And it's, you know, who you truly are, which is nobody like you are, you have an identity that you construct, right? So like I was born and I'm sitting here right now and even as we're talking, I'm taking certain things that have happened in my life and assigning meaning to them and using that meaning to create this sense of identity of who I am, right? Shit has been happening to me since the second I was born. Constantly, at every second, I'm getting feedback and I'm getting, you know, uh, stimulant, Mm -hmm. you know? But I have said, oh, this heartbreak, oh, this success, this thing, this has constructed my sense of who I am and like Mm -hmm. myself and part of the dissolution of ego is realizing that that is completely false. That's not you. You are indescribable as a being. You are, you know, traitless. You are without categorization. You are indescribable. You just are, period. You just are a manifestation of existence. And the more that you think about thinking, that you try and grasp the mind, it's like the eye trying to see the eye. It's something that, like, we cannot comprehend yeah. And, you know, part of like Taoism, they always say like the 10,000 things, right? So, mm-hmm. so one of the first things that uh, I learned about Buddhism through uh, Alan Watts, The Way of Zen, which is like Alan Watts is a brilliant author. He's like one of the guys who brought uh, Eastern <coughs> culture to the West. Mm-hmm. This book, he has some books that are more like druggy trippy. He has some books that are more like history. So this one is like a very kind of like intense history of like the development of Buddhism. But one of the introductory lessons that he teaches uh, that you have to get through if you're going to like really read and study the shit is that in the West and in the East, the ideas of concrete and abstract are reversed, Mm -hmm. right? So here in the West, we say, if I say that chair is large, that's considered to be an abstraction. If I say that chair weighs 10 pounds, that is a concrete, that is a specific. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. actually, a pound is nothing. A pound is this idea that I've categorized the world into a way where I can understand it and I can say, that's a piece of furniture, this is a teddy bear, these are photos, that's a person. Like That's how we process the world is by categorizing things. But that actually is not a specific, that's an abstraction. That's an abstraction of like, so I developed this system of mathematics and I developed this class of weight and I decided that there's this thing called a pound or whatever that we're going to measure something by. That's the abstraction. The concrete is indescribable. It just is. It's not even that is a large chair. It's just that. That yeah, period. That period. And, and that's something that, you know, I think a lot of people confuse and sort of, you know, that was a big turning point for me in, in understanding that is that everything that I take to be like a factual, concrete, like categorization, categorization or description of something is actually just like the culture and society and like the institutionalization of like our intelligence and shit, like getting trapped in ego and trying to understand the world. Uh, Huxley, who's like one of the first, you know, people behind like the psychedelic experience who wrote The Doors of Perception. He's like mm-hmm. one of the first people to like write about tripping mescaline. He viewed the brain. He had a theory of the brain that it was basically like a reducing valve, a filter. And according to him, we go out in the world. If I didn't have this brain filtering out experience, I would have a complete meltdown right now. I would be like, I mean, in many ways, that's like what people say, you know, people who are autistic are highly motivated by like get overstimulated because they don't have the filtering skills in the same way to focus on this and not have 
the loud noise or whatever the thing is, you know, it's, compartmentalize an, it's, it. it's to compartmentalize, you know, mm-hmm. overstimulation. So, so Huxley said that, you know, one of the main functions of the brain is to filter experience mm-hmm. so that I can sit in this room and just be focused on you guys and mm-hmm. not, you know, hear the car outside, see this, be staring at this light, whatever. Sure. And that's honestly one of the things that like when we take psychedelics, we dissolve mm-hmm. is the brain sort of like filter filter. and that's why we feel this interconnectedness of experience oh let me look at the patterns on this tree is because the veil is lifted and we do see sort of the unity of things and that's something that can be achieved with psychedelics it can be achieved through i believe honestly religion i'm sure that there are some jews and christians and Muslims and people who practice traditional Western religions who have all truly had that transcendental moment Mm -hmm. just based on their practice. I also think that like the institutionalization of Western religion has moved it very far away in many ways from like what Eastern religion is all about. For sure. You know, so, so I think that, yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting once you like kind of get into this and it, it just really forces you to examine like, well, what am I? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it's, I think like the, what you're saying about the practice of it is though very tough, you know, like yeah, the, the, it's a nightmare, the, you know, <laughs> because like, I think when we, when we talk about this type of stuff and, and take this like selective moment right here to really think about it or whether you meditate and give yourself a time in day, it's like, then you hit the routine of your day and you're back to normal. And it's that constant like push and pull of, that's why self help is such a huge thing. It's like, you want to listen to this, uh, audio book or you want to read this and you, you get these gems in these moments of thought that really creates instant clarity and makes you feel like you take a step back to find that thing to find that inner happiness what makes you happy who am I what does this all kind of mean but practticing it and remembering that yeah. is no, it's, fucking it's, completely different. it's not an instantaneous that's, no it, 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 it's like I've, like recently I've been figuring, trying to like realize, you know, going back to kind of things that identify you, right? Okay. You have to find inner happiness. Otherwise you're never going to really achieve it with anything. Like for me, it could be money, right? Until I hit this amount, I can't really be happy because this is my, your benchmark. This is what I'm fucking entitled to. That's my fucked up mind, right? I'm entitled for this. I've worked hard enough. I deserve this. And this is going to get me all the things I need, want and whatever status, things whatever and but and then when i step back and i'm like okay let me just enjoy these moments let me just find myself enjoy this podcast enjoy my day-to-day enjoy my wife all these like things that bring me real happiness however i still feel a complete inner restlessness about still attaining this and it's like okay is that a self-worth issue And where the fuck did that come from? Like, so it's like this constant quest of figuring out why does that even matter? Why am I even tying these things? Where did that start? And also practicing constantly being okay with where you are now. But that's just like, I know we'll, we'll end this podcast. I'll probably drive home and someone will cut me off on the way home. and I'll be like, you know, it's right back to normal. Fuck you and, and your Mercedes, man. Like it's yeah. just like you know, it, I, whatever it is, it's it, just you, you get snapped back into it so fast, so easily. And I, I think that you know, again, if you seek, it's because you have a question, right? If you you don't read three dozen books on Buddhism unless like you're trying to figure something out in your life. Right, and like, sure. it's so it's something that even though I say this all the time, even though like I probably know more knowledge about this and have like an academic understanding of sure. it more than probably, you know, 60 to 70% of people walking around LA, if not more, there are also times where like, I kind of know nothing about it. Cause mm-hmm. like the whole reason I'm reading the shit is cause like, in the day to day, I get caught up in my anxieties, my desires, my yeah. attachments, and I have to like read the shit. So it forces me to take a step back. Yeah. You know, find understanding with exactly. And to, and to actually like look at that. And, and it's weird because, you know, the whole concept of reading a book about Buddhism is kind of like flawed in a sense. For sure. <laughs> you know, For it's like sure, something you're not though. supposed to be able to like, learn, <laughs> especially like the more Western stuff. <laughs> right, I mean, right. so when you read some of the source texts, it's nice because like, 
I mean, so there's a, a great book I read. It's called Dropping Ashes on the Buddha. And it's uh, just all the like teachings of this uh, Zen master from the 70s. And the type of stuff that's in that book, it's so hard to comprehend. They're called koans. They're like the, basically the riddles of like, you know, Buddhism. Okay. And it's literally something like a student came to the master and said, you know, master, what is the meaning of life? And the master slapped a stick on the ground what <laughs> you know what i mean uh the master asked the student you know uh what is you know if i have two apples and like i throw them in the pail like what is the color of the sky and like but it's this thing where like the response is not thinking mm. you slap the teacher you throw the bucket you do the it's like it's action that's what it's all calling you toward is action mm, for mm. sure and, and i think that that's something you know when we talk about how to coexist, right? Because you can't fully, I mean, maybe I'll go to India and like, you know, just hide away there for a while. But like, if you're going to live and like work in like a creative, motivated, entrepreneurially driven society, capitalistic society, sure. you have to reconcile both aspects of your personality. Yeah. And there are things about my mm. identity and like my like self love that as a process of this whole journey have actually like, I've discovered and enjoy, you know, like one thing is after doing these, you know, music videos, like I realized like I could totally embrace being this like crazy dressing, like Jewish guy stoner. Like I could just like, there were certain things that I did like feel liberated. Like, Oh, I can just be myself now. Like I don't have to wear the button down and try and like be the corporate stiff or whatever. Like I'm free to be a creative and that's very liberating and I can express myself. But at the same time, you have to keep as much as you can, like the knowledge that that is actually nothing, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I think that mm. like, but you, but you can have, as long as you're not attached to them, you can have worldly pleasures. Like you can have like worldly desires. It's just, you can't be attached to them. Yeah. You, you, you can't know? give them the value of your happiness. Yeah. You, Cause yeah. you actually, you know, the, the Buddha, when he first set out from the palace that he like grew up in, he went and he lived in like the forest with like the ascetics and like did a starve, you know, starved himself and relinquished all of his clothing and all of his possessions because there were a lot of people in that time in like India and China who were like trying to seek this enlightenment before the Buddha. That was like kind of the cultural mm -hmm. zeitgeist of the moment. And he determined that that was not the way to give up all your possessions, to renounce your family name, like to live in complete squalor was not the way to enlightenment. He didn't reach enlightenment until he, you know, had been with the princess and had like started the family and like could work and toil on the land and could do all of these things, but without attachment. Sure. And that's the idea. Just be, you know, you can be in love. You can be like, you know, angry. You can have all these emotions if you're experiencing them organically and you're letting them pass. Right. So like that's mm -hmm. something that you read about a lot in meditation is a lot of people think meditation <coughs> is quieting the mind no, no. and like maybe it is for people who like practice it very extensively. I'm not there yet, but for me, like when I'm meditating, I'm constantly getting off on one thought and yeah. it's just, you just say, okay, now return to center. It's letting the thoughts pass by without judgment, without attachment and then recentering. Yeah, I've been getting into meditation recently too. It's funny. It's just like this wave, the same shit that, that you're on and talking about. The reason I've gotten into meditation is, yeah, it's not to quiet the mind. It's to just like stop and just let things be. Like try to live in that be. And what's crazy is like the last few times I've done it, I've actually started crying. I don't know why, but I just like, it's the... the it, I think it's just like really nestling in to that is a weird, crazy thing because you're in such a, like the grind of like work and life, especially yeah. in this city, especially in like an entertainment industry, whether it's music or, or film or anything is so highly competitive and you're so stimulated by your work, the competition, what, everything you see on Instagram, all your expectations for yourself and all these other things that are like at any moment can influence your livelihood, you know, like, and that's where a lot of the pressure comes from. It's like, if you're not getting booked for two months. That's directly affecting your livelihood. Right. Even at, like, fuck your ego. It's 
your bills, you yeah. know? And those of your employees. Like, like your yeah. basic needs and those of your employees can be fucked. But when you, when you kind of, and you, to detach from that, to try to like separate your, that, that from there and just be even okay with that, that that's a possibility because that's part of the sacrifice. That's also what makes it so good is like, you know, it can be that bad. You know, it, that can happen. Right. But you have to like take that just the same exact way you take a high moment and be in that balance. And it's, it's just a, uh, for me, meditating has been trying to just be okay with like, all right, let me just do this for 10 minutes and I'm going to just be for 10 fucking minutes in my day and try to balance that. It's a, it's a weird, it's been a weird like emotional thing. But but the way that it affects you is like, it's incredible. Yeah. yeah. Just ta- literally yeah. just taking that time and yeah. Sitting, oh, like, so it's, it's actually overwhelming. It's a yeah. sense of yeah. peace. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and it's different every time, you know, there are some sure. times where you sit and you have a session and you're like, fuck, my mind was so restless. Like I was just like, counting down to like when my timer was going to go off yeah and there are other times where like i've touched like a plane where i'm like whoa like holy shit like i just went somewhere into myself and like experienced this bliss and experienced this like kind of freeness this levity and uh yeah you know i i think that that's for me kind of what what the journey is is like as i continue you know, I'm at a new stage in my career. The company is at a new stage and where we are, you know, we're now expanding and now trying to, you know, continue to build off what we've already done. Mm. And simultaneously to that, I'm trying to develop my ability to detach from it in a way. Sure. And it's tough because like, it's kind of my burden that I've literally been living a narrative that you can start at 12 and like draw the line and say, oh, it's like this one thing like psycho films like that has been my identity if you ask somebody who met me when i was in middle school and they said tell me about joe if you met somebody who met me last week that's what they would say that's what they know about me Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. and uh i think that i because who knows what the future will be i mean i have the utmost confidence in what we do and the mission and the product but life is very unpredictable and like i you know for me am working to discover the fulfillment in not knowing Mm -hmm. and the fulfillment in life itself regardless of whatever happens for you sure know? it's incredible trying to fucking mm. up a lot but trying to <laughs> well we have to like how the fuck do we know what right is if we haven't experienced the wrong yeah, yeah. You know what i'm saying <sighs> that's also a very uh very taoist idea Facts. that's the whole yin and yang you yep. know yeah it's beautiful this has been phenomenal man i um, fucking love it and thank you just like for being as vulnerable and, and just outspoken so freely about every aspect of this, like your personal, you know, journey and becoming as well as just like the hardcore kind of business hustle grind and showing both sides like very openly. I think that's a in, in a way like I, I tell Nushi, like in a way that's just brave to do and hard to do. Absolutely. Um, especially when you're trying to uphold an image or um, a brand or anything where a lot of times like that's what you should do you yeah. should try to be as free as possible as open as possible but um it can be hard to even expose the good and some of the weird you know yeah no definitely i mean as i've gone through my journey you know there have been times where i've been depressed or i've had crazy anxiety and i've <clears throat> had to decide like as an artist am i responsible to put this all out there mm-hmm. and like what do I keep private? What do I let people know is going on? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I've just found that it goes both ways. When I put something out there, people have helped me by reaching out and saying, I've gone through this. Like I have X, Y, or Z like, yeah. And there've been people who have hit me up and said, you know, Oh, I saw what you posted. Like that was helpful to me in this time. So like that's humanity, bro. bro. Just put that shit out there. And like, you don't know, what's going to affect other people, what's going to affect you. But I just sort of realized at some point, you know, I have to be honest with what I'm going through to be honest to my creative self. And like, that means being honest with people about where I am and like how the questioning has manifested itself. And, you know, hopefully that's, what's going to give me the tools to keep doing what I love to do in the future, you know? For sure. I mean, bro, like, imagine the possibility and potential for humanity if we all, like, viewed transparency and vulnerability as a baseline. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, 
Let There Be Freedom. Big Do you feel me? Damn straight. This has been fucking gorgeous. Yeah, this yeah, has man. been great, guys. My brother, thank you for yeah. sharing your beautiful journey. Oh, thank you, guys. I can't wait to see your continued growth, not only personally, but professionally, and just everything about you. You're one of the most gorgeous human beings I've had the pleasure of coming across. Oh, I feel the same about you, Nushi. You know what I'm saying? Um, for those that, that don't know where to find you, where can people reach out to you, um, whether just like for a question or listening to this podcast, want to reach out to you? Yeah, so uh, everything, all you know, the work and the information about getting in touch with us can be found at our website, psychofilms.org. Uh, there's a general, basically, like, inquiry email uh, that, you know, I'll try as much as I can to, like, respond to anything, you know, that comes in. Uh, I'm on Instagram, at the homie Joe Weil, because I'm the homie. You are the homie. Right. And, uh, yeah, you know, uh, they can find me out there in the world, man. They Let's can find it. me on Melrose Avenue. They can find me fucking wandering the forests, you know. They can find me in the in the great abyss. Like, I love it. That's I'm right. just, you know, out in the universe living my damn life. I love it. Beautiful. Cool. Make sure you call your mother and tell her you love her, y'all. Yo. You know what I'm saying? Holla. Uh, I spoke to her today. <laughs> <laughs> that was fucking awesome.